He doesn't care about the NCAA, but he probably needs to go to AA. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on the church with him, Nick. Get it on. Welcome to the show. We're uh, loaded for bear. Mike O'Malley's in studio. Good to see you, Mike. Good to see you, Ace. I think people know him best from uh, Yes, Dear. Uh, a few seasons. Got like six seasons. I know him best from Guts. CBS. Guts and... Wait, what's Guts? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it was a Nickelodeon game show. It's like the Nickelodeon version of American Gladiators. Oh, did yeah. you host it? Yes, I hosted it, and uh, we did probably 150 episodes. That was my uh, second gig. I, I hosted an, uh, another show for Nickelodeon called Get the Picture. Yeah, that's like back when I was like 23, 24 years old. Legend. Lenny, speaking of legend, Lenny Clark, comedian, actor, is uh, coming to us via Zoom. How you doing, Hammer? Good to see you, man. It's been a while. It has been a while. Uh, Lenny, I, you know, quintessential Boston comedian, been there, done that, worked with them all, saw it all. Uh, and Mike was telling me before the show you had some funny stories, uh, Sam Kinison stories. I mean, but <laughs> everyone passed through Boston coming up, right? Right in the yes. right in the yeah. salad days there. Like who who were yeah. some of the names that came through there back when you were there? A Whitney Brown, I remember he was working with Saturday Night Live. Uh well, you had Billy Burr Bill Burr, uh Louis C. K, Dane Cook, Paula Poundstone, uh Rosie O'Donnell came in. Uh I mean these are just the people I can remember. You know, my memory is shot now. But uh, yeah, pretty much anyone and everyone came through there. Uh, Robin like, Robin Williams came through. Bobcat Goldwaite, of course. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, everyone, was everyone uh, Fitzsimmons and Joe Rogan coming through there too? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, the, the place was insane. You know, before we started at the Ding Ho, which is a Chinese restaurant in Cambridge, uh, there was only New York. L.A., a little bit of Chicago. That was the only place you could work. There was only about maybe 120 comedians in the whole country. Now, there's only about 120 people that aren't comedians. Everybody. <laughs> oh, look, TikTok, me, live, man. You touch me, you'll be. I don't say it's insane. But, Lenny, but, I, yeah. Lenny, I was I was reading a, a book about the history of WBCN, and it talked about a, a classic story of you and, and Sam Kinison where you guys were partying, but... When I was talking to you before coming on the show, before I told Adam, you know, you guys, he couldn't get work, Sam Kennison, and no. and you had to put him on. Can you just tell that oh, story? Yeah. Well, we were working together at the comedy store, and he'd say, Lenny, man, you're the big gun in Boston. Can you get me at Boston? I go, yeah, I'll get you. I'll get you. And so I called Mike. I said, we got to bring this guy in. He goes, I said, well, what's he doing? I said, you're going to love him. So we came in, and we had him booked the whole week. And the first four clubs, he got banned at. Banned in Boston. <laughs> first four clubs. They said, get him out of here. We don't want him in there. It was unbelievable. So he shows up on a Friday night at Stitches, which was my gig. Friday and Saturday, I worked in Boston. And then I'd fly out to L.A. and do the week in L.A. And then go back to Boston. I wasn't making any money in L.A. and Boston. I was, oh, man, I was raking it in. So... He comes in and I said, "Man, you can't, you can't go on here, man. I, I, I could lose my job. Everything. Else. Do you trust me, Len? Do you trust me? Bring on the beast. Put the beast on." <laughs> so he was there with a bottle, a half bottle of Moe, and I went out and I said, "Ladies and gentlemen, a good buddy of mine, uh, let's give him a nice welcome to Boston, Sam Kennison." And he finished the bottle of Moe, threw it down burped and said someone's fucking me tonight and from that on <laughs> he did 45 minutes of undeniable burn the place down and the owners said we want you to work the back room which is the paradise you know i don't know how many it's a, but it was a big big hall and he never worked a small room again he was just and he was set for life I and mean, that was it he was, after he scored there people were be begging for him what was different about that performance and all the other ones he got banned for? Was it the booze? Was it the proclamation well, about much. getting laid? <laughs> yeah, that and the fact that you know, my crowd was a big drinking crowd. And, uh, you know, people knew from just coming to see me every week that they never knew what. Chris Rock, Chris Rock came in when I put him on one night. I mean, it was just like people knew they could expect something different. And it, it was different, man, because I remember 
after he scored big, we, we drank until, you know, bars closed in Boston at one. And uh, we we were drinking at some bar till like four. And then they threw us out. And I remember Sam going, Lenny, where can we get more booze? I go, well, you know, it's 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 done. There's no more booze till like 7.30. I know a bar, we can go at 7.30. He goes, what are we going to do for three hours? I said, I, I don't know. He said, wait a minute. You picked me up in a limo, and the limo had plenty of booze. I said, yeah, I said, all that limo. So I called the limo, and I shut up a booze. I said, you're a genius. And we just drank, we drank pretty much the whole week. I never know what the limo booze is, because they always put it in those crystal goblets, you know, those decanters, <laughs> yeah. those weird unmarked. unmarked things. I'm assuming it's the cheapest booze on the planet mixed with a little piss <laughs> if you didn't tip the driver. <laughs> but it's well, all... But we, it's, we it's, had, yeah. Go ahead. Well, we it's the booze case. you drink after you're drunk. <laughs> right. Cause, exactly, because because exactly. the thing there's there's the food you eat before you're drunk and then the food you eat <laughs> yeah. after you're drunk. Like, oh, they oh, yeah. found a oh, slice yeah. of pizza under the sofa <laughs> pillow. That should well, do. You, you know, well, we, we, had, we had tipped this guy really big the, the first night we had him. And he came with uh, two boxes of top shelf booze. And when we got out of that limo, it was gone. It was, it was, I mean, he could drink more. He was he was all pro drinker. And did you end up going somewhere that opened at 7.30 in the morning? <laughs> we went to a hotel, uh, and he had a couple he had a couple of girls. Uh, it, it, that was it, it was insane. I mean, yeah. Um, we ended up at, at a hotel. That was great self editing. You just, you just did there. You know what? It, you it, you paused, and what was great about it is that you had set up that you know your memory was shot, so you could just say, "Yeah, I didn't remember." When you decided, it was very elegant. It was almost like you were on the Today Show. Who, <laughs> who are these guys with the motor and the libido? You, you know what I mean? Like you you drink a fifth of Jack Daniels, and now you're ready to fuck. And I'm like, I'm ready to go to bed. Oh no, I'm already I'm ready to attempt to masturbate. And then get yeah. frustrated and then go to bed. But Frustrated with yourself? I don't need two girls. Yeah. No. I, I, oh, well, you know, I, I, I wasn't lazy. I remember I, I, I was jerking off one night so hard I threw my shoulder off. But aside from that, there was, there was, I was one of those guys, you know, some guys do blow and they can't have sex. Oh, my God. I was like, I was like a Chinese rabbit. You know mm. what I mean? I, I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. Yeah, you're you're high functioning on on blow. Yeah, on blow and and yeah, but like you said, but you finish a, a bottle of Jack Daniels. I mean, how 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 good can you be? <laughs> it was blow. Here's my frustration with blow. Yeah, uh, <laughs> when it was all the rage. Yes, back in the '80s, it was about 110 bucks a gram. Mm. Correct. Maybe 120 bucks a mm. gram. I wanted to party, but I made $8 an hour, and taxes right. were taken out. Man. So I could literally snort two days of work in 14 minutes, and it and I work construction. And it never right. made sense to me to dig ditches all day to get just 10 minutes worth of, of cocaine. Now, I'm rich. And cocaine's like thirty bucks a gram. Is it cheaper? It's cheaper, and I could wow. easily afford a coke habit now. Easily, right. it's probably even a write-off. <laughs> uh, but I don't want to do it because you know it's probably got fentanyl in it, and I got kids and and whatnot. But you don't want to die. I don't want to yeah. die. But even before the fentanyl thing, people were telling me, "Oh yeah, I was making hundreds of thousands of dollars," and they're like, "Yeah, coke's like twenty-five, thirty a gram," and I was like, "What? Wow. Wow, it's so." So cheap Adam, now. I was buying quarter grams for twenty five dollars, fifteen hundred dollars worth of quarter grams because I didn't want to commit. I said, "Lenny, why don't you just get an eight ball? You'll save money." I go, "No, no, no! I don't want to get hooked on this stuff." <laughs> All right. And then, then I ended up going to South America to see where they made it, and Senior Lenny was in for a big surprise. Yeah, I bought uh, I bought an ounce for eighty dollars. And uh, in South America, yeah, in South America, it, it, it was in Cartagena. And uh, All and right, wait a minute. Go. Let's let, wait. Let's see if we can do. <laughs> let's see if we can do some metric math here. Okay. Uh, so a gram was a hundred bucks, hundred and twenty bucks. Yep. An yep. eight ball was an eighth ounce. Right. 
and right. an eight ball was like four grams or like three and a half, three and a half or four grams. It was like three hundred dollars, maybe two, two, two seven, two eighty. I don't know. Right, but but a full gram would have been like twelve, thirteen hundred bucks, fourteen hundred bucks, right? Yeah. Oh God, yes. And you yep. you got a you got a full ounce for eighty bucks. Eighty dollars, and I got to tell you, it was magnificent. Yeah. And I, it was wow. I couldn't finish it. You know, I left some for the maids. My room was spotless, but I got to tell you, it was. Uh, you know, I was I was in South America and Senior Lenny had cash and I was throwing it around and oh my God, I walked out of my hotel room one day. Well, I was so high because the girl I was with didn't really want to do it, you know. So I, <laughs> I did so much. I walk out my hotel room and there is every branch of the uh Columbia service, subs, tanks, the Humvees. I, I swear to God, right there, and boats, uh, destroyers, and, and I walked out. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God! And 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 I I thought it was they were there for me, <laughs> and then I realized they were just doing uh, exercises, and I went, wow, I, I I better go get more high to watch this. Was uh, yeah, you said you had you know good cocaine, like yeah, so. I once remember one of my friends, he worked all year on Miami Vice. Oh, man. Yep. Yeah. And uh, came back to, to L.A. And we were going to some prom or dance or something. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. But he was just like, have you had Miami Vice cocaine? And I'm like, no, I just get whatever whatever eight dollars an hour will buy me out, out here you know and he goes oh well you haven't and and he gave me a rail of miami vice cocaine oh. i was like oh this is what people are talking about this yes. is good cocaine yes yes, yes. Yeah, and then i kind of went oh i get why everyone's into this what what is it for those of us who don't do cocaine or haven't been to columbia to do cocaine i asked this to both of you what is the high that you get? What is that feeling? Chasing the next high. It's horrible. It's, it's, I, I, I mean, beg to differ. Uh, <laughs> Adam, Adam, I went out with an unattractive pharmacist to get pharmaceutical cocaine. You ever try that? No. Oh, no. I mean, I've been I, out with unattractive pharmacists, but I never, <laughs> I never got the coke <laughs> off them. Lose, lose, I think is what they call that. I, I, we Who's got free condoms. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you like? So this, clearly, this woman had no ethics. All right, she she just gave well, it to you. Well, I had to take her out to dinner. You know. And, <laughs> and, 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 what was the pharmaceutical grade cocaine? Like? Oh my god. The tiniest line you could imagine. And I'm going, what is this? That's not going to get behind him. Oh, and it was like, Jess, no, no, you know, it didn't lose your vision. And I mean, it was, it was, not, it was just, it was better than the, the pure stuff I was getting in Colombia. I don't know how they do it. You know what I mean? Maybe refined differently. I don't know, but it was amazing. But what I want to hear uh, why you guys beg to differ. Well, the coke, so cocaine gets mixed with a lot of speed back in the day, and you just yes. feel kind of speedy. Okay. And speedy yeah. just was agitated, you know. And it just, I, I never, I never liked it. Um, ecstasy used to be real speedy, you know. And so it, 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 it's like you wanted to go to bed, but you couldn't go to bed. Yeah. But you weren't really high, but yeah. you were kind of annoyed, and it wasn't good. <laughs> And and then just the cocaine in it, in its purest form, the mind you've, up, you, you've never felt better about yourself. You never yeah, felt right. better about your surroundings. Smarter. You, just, you were so much smarter. Smarter, better looking. You like what you oh, yeah. see looking back in the mirror. You know. Yeah. And oh yeah. And it wasn't. You know. It's not like the drunk high or, or the pot high. This is a. I feel globally great about myself right now. That's that's how it works. I want to see a documentary like 20 years from now, and it started. At what point did the rise of cocaine use just go up? And it was just this monologue that Adam gave. <laughs> Kids, uh, if you're listening. <laughs> no, now it's all got fentanyl in it, and you can't mess, oh, no, can't you. mess with don't, any. Don't, yeah, listen, it's not, it's not, I did, I did 30 years of, I mean, I, it, it was, it's, I regret it 
Although, like you say, there were some, there were some good times. There was some. Oh my God, yeah. I mean, but I mean, I would, I would take it and end up places. I remember I ended up. I was, I went to, I went to see the mob wanted to see me when I was getting big in Boston, and uh, wait, 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 the mob wanted to see you. Yes, the mob. The, By the way, the watch Extended Family. It's about a family uh, on NBC, yeah. 830. This is uh, Lenny Clark talking about cocaine uh, benders yes, and I'm, the mob wanting to see him in and Boston. I am, and I'm the second oldest man on network television, and Tom Selleck's not doing that good. So anyway, <laughs> they said to me, Lenny, the, the, these guys want to see it. I don't go over there and fool around. These guys are serious guys. You know, I said, don't worry about me. So I went over, I went in, we... We had a beer, and they go, is that all you're going to drink? Like, then they broke up for stall. Then we're doing lines at the table. Then we're smoking. Then we took a couple of pills, and I ended up in Bermuda. I mean, it was unbelievable. I, I woke up, and there was waves crashing. On. I looked out the window, and it was like a storm. I go, Gee, I call up. I go, excuse me, can you tell me where I am? Yes, Mr. Clark, you're at the Hamilton Beach Princess in Bermuda. And I went, where did I park? I don't remember the fight. I don't remember anything. It was, yeah, that was. Wait, wait, that was, wait, wait a minute, Lenny. You just, you just ran through that story. The mob wants to meet you. Who tells yeah. you this? Uh, one, of the, one of the owners at the club. And so you got to go where? To the North End? To the North End, yeah. Yeah. And uh, very nice fellas, well-dressed. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, I, I know, but, and, you were, but why did they want to meet you? Because they thought I was funny. You know, they, they heard me on the radio. They heard me do sports radio. And then some of their friends would go to see me. They got to see this guy. He's out of his mind. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it was, man, I I, I can't believe, I, I can't believe I, I, I'm still alive and uh, I mean, I'm playing with house money, no doubt about it. But I, uh, you know, I haven't done that in but 28 years now, 27 years. Did you ever, I remember one time, I mean, see, this is a, I had a group of guys that had no money. So if you make money doing a 15, 20 minute, 45 minute set, see, mm -hmm. okay, here's, let, let's try to define this. There's money is money, but there's but earning it is different when when you dig oh, yeah. ditches and bust up stucco and haul stuff out to dumpsters all day uh that's different money you go oh, yeah. you know you, you it could be a hundred bucks but if you just get a hundred bucks for doing a 10 minute right. set you might oh, yeah. tip the cocktail waitress the hundred bucks they yeah. gave you right but if yeah. you get the hundred bucks for digging ditches and busting up stock stucco that's a different you made that bucks. money you know Absolutely. you actually what the effort right. that went into getting it's that. a lot easier to buy cocaine when you're getting paid to stand on stage do crowd work Tell fart jokes, hold a beer in your hand, stand in air conditioning, fuck cocktail waitresses. You know, it, it's easier to spend it on that. Is that does that sound accurate? Well, Adam, yes, but when I would fly back from LA, I flew back and forth from Boston to LA every weekend for 18 months, never missed a flight. And it, and I would land in Boston at 4 30 in the afternoon, and it would be three drug dealers waiting to hang out with me for the weekend. Wow. Did yeah, you ever I mean, get was, did you ever get in bad debt to them? There was no debt. I was their joke monkey. Come on, you know what I mean? I mean I, I kept them laughing all the time. Come to the shows. They'd meet broads. They'd be, it was it was like it was a fun time. Oh, so you got it for free. Yeah, most of the time. Well, yeah. this is well, my point. Yeah. This is e easier then because I I've, I've got a bunch of blue collar guys from North Hollywood that are making 9 bucks an hour. And it was a precious commodity. We actually got a guy, we had a guy who didn't chip in and he, he wanted to do it, but we kept telling him no, cause he didn't chip in. And by the way, yeah. I, I, unless you think I'm Pablo Escobar here, <laughs> I, I did this like four or five times and I was like, I make nine bucks yeah, an hour. I'm going to buy anymore. natty lights and go to the park right. and catch a yeah. righteous buzz. <laughs> uh, but there was one guy anyway, at some point uh, we drew him a line of baking soda and and he just snorted that whole line of baking so like there was a lot there was uh, there was some shenanigans in there but you know you probably did lines of shit that you know talcum powder and baking oh, soda sure. and you, everything sure. else horse laxative uh, i mean and, and adam uh i was pablo escobar uh, <laughs> i married my dealer that's how bad it was oh really 
Yeah, I married a redheaded what Jewish. What was the dude's name? I, was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, 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 uh, yeah, I, I don't want. To, she's still alive, so I don't want to mention her name. But she was a, a redheaded Jewish Playboy model, cocaine dealer from Birmingham, Alabama. And you wow. left her for the pharmaceutical? Uh, no, no, the pharmaceutical girl was before her. But when I, I remember the first night we, we were together, she woke up. She said, "Lenny, I thought you had stolen some of the coke." And after being with two days, I realized you just do so much. I said, yeah, well, you know, just a little bit more. Would you never sleep? I never slept. That's why I sleep a lot now. I didn't sleep then. I, I went 30 years. I don't remember sleeping, you know. And they say when you get older, you don't need as much sleep. Oh, no, that's wrong. I need sleep all the time now. Yeah. I. Uh, how, how were you high on stage most of the time? Oh, yeah. Oh, God almighty. I, I mean, drunk, high. I mean, like, 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 people people would fill me with, with, with shit to see how crazy I could be. And, uh, I mean, I I can't believe. When I quit, I got stage fright. I couldn't. I said, I, I can't do this. My brother, you're going to do it. Sold out. I was at the hot tin roof on the vineyard, Martha's Vineyard. And uh, I called my brother. He goes, I don't think I can do it. He goes, it's sold out, man. There's lines outside. you got to do it. And I go, I, I can't. He says, call me when you get into the parking lot. I will start announcing. You walk up. You just walk on the stage and you're already on. And I go, yeah, that makes sense. So I did it and I got a couple laughs and it was horrible. I had stage fright for like two months. It was horrible. Wow. All right. So let me ask you, you so you, you decide you're not going to do cocaine because of just the, the financial aspects of it. And yes. you're doing and, and Lenny, you're getting it for free. Yep. I had a friend who uh, you know, decided he was going to try to do heroin. And this is the, something that I never – when somebody said to me, doing heroin is like 200 times happiness, I was like, well, I don't want to know what that feels like. Because then yeah. once you know what that feels like, you're going to want to go there ever again. Have you ever had friends who like to have described – heroin and why they do it i just would be i was just terrified i i would ever like i've never dropped acid because there was a guy well, i went to university of new hampshire who had dropped a lot of acid and he just seemed like he never came back his head was sort of tilted to the side and you got the jim ignatowski syndrome right. I mean, <laughs> and that and that that worked on me i was like i don't want to know i don't know you know yeah, well, I, you know, my thing was either I'm going to never stop throwing up with heroin or I'm going to fucking love the shit out of it, and they're both bad outcomes. Yeah. So you, Yeah, so you never tried it. Yeah, I feel that way with certain sexual positions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I'm either going to vomit or I'm never going to stop. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and, now, and now it's just like, ow, ow. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, I don't, I don't want to well, get hurt. Well, I, I tried the heroin. I, I smoked it. I snorted it. I, I smoked Hold on, it. Not you. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I never shot it up. Because uh, and not because I was afraid of needles. I was just lazy. I'm not gonna sit there and cook. What am I a chef? I just want to get high. I don't want to learn how to make shit. Yeah, <laughs> tying off. Anytime yeah. oh. you have to use your teeth for half the work, <laughs> you're up to no good. I don't care if you're opening pretzels. It's always a bad. It's always bad if your mouth is doing half the job. And that's that's I uh, need to do five, once again. <laughs> you need to do five minutes on that. I've never even heard anybody talk about that. You gotta no, use I your teeth. Either. It's just I like a thing. Either. Like one of the things that just you don't know where that tube. Your... You don't know where that tubing's been. <laughs> it's, it's not only that. It's just like <laughs> you want to talk about like the least sanitary thing in the world. Your buddy at the flop house. <laughs> just gets done and then hands you the surgical <laughs> tubing and you put it in your mouth now <laughs> you got a guy with covered with hepatitis over here <laughs> who's just sucking off this tube and now he hands it to you and it's marks. covered it's covered with the pus from the oh. yeah what is and what's etiquette you go which side did you put in your mouth tim <laughs> was it this side because i i do the work with the, with the dry side it's always it's always tim yeah. It's just like, oh, you yeah. <laughs> and then something happens and you sneeze and you blow air into oh. your veins and then you have an oh. aneurysm. Oh. Oh. I mean, all oh. the dangers. <laughs> uh, wait, but, but Artie, the thing is, is that when you tried heroin. Wait, Lenny. I'm uh, sorry. Lenny, Lenny. Although sorry. Artie's a good name for Lenny, drugs, no, no, too. No, 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 Lenny, yeah. Lenny, when you, when you, 
when you did your... Uh... He didn't tie off. No. Okay, no, but when you started it, were you high on Coke? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you yeah. didn't get the real effect, right? You didn't know yeah, what it felt like. I guess like, not. I don't know. I mean, I smoked it. I snorted it. I I, I, I ate it. I put it on I put it on cereal. I thought I'd be like, uh, <laughs> you know, Bill Bill Lee. You know what I mean? I, I'm throwing on cereal. See how that works? Yeah, it's not good. It's, uh, so you've never done... Uh, you never no, done acid. Just a lot. Never done acid. Just drank. Oh, drank a lot of beer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jägermeister. It was, mm-hmm. it was not. Uh, you know, just just drinking beer and drank plenty of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was you know I was very uh, you know Irish Catholic kid with a lot of uh, you know did not did not want to wake up with a lot of guilt about what I want. You know, oh really? What, yeah. Just just always uh, you know. I think that, you know, when you tr- – listen, I mean, plenty of stupid things you do when you drink too much beer too. But it's just mm-hmm. – um, I was – I would uh, – it, it worked on me. Like you said, you're like uh, the guy on Taxi. It's like, you know, you're going to drop ass and you're never going to come back, which is what's amazing to me now when you hear these guys – you know, yes. like Michael Pollan writes the book about, you know – Microdosing. Yeah, microdosing and all of this and, and you know, it's interesting because I was never – I never, you know, smoked pot. Uh, well, Lenny – you were a pioneer in microdosing, buying all those I, quarter grams. <laughs> that, all those fifteen hundred dollars worth of quarter grams was microdosing yeah, back in the day. Never been accused of being a bright businessman. No, but I, I I did acid once because, like I said, the beer led to the booze, the booze, the, the blow, and so then we took the acid one day and we were down the Charles River, and I thought this duck was talking to me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and then, it was Gilbert Godfrey. And, and then, <laughs> so then I, I started, I really got friendly with the duck and he, he stopped talking. I said, hey, what's, what's your problem? I, I just asked you a question. So, so we, we got a barrel. We put a barrel on. We took him back to the bar. And we're sitting in the bar, drink with the duck. You know, and he was what, like, the, like the make way for ducklings, like that famous kids book, like the, yeah, one of these exactly. guys, like the, the mallets. Yeah. You took away yeah, Mr. Like, Mallet, yeah, exactly, right off the river. And uh, you know, people say, hey, "What are you doing with the duck?" I says, "He'll tell you." You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that my experience now. Now the only one we haven't covered is mushrooms. Wait, have you done acid? Oh. Wait, have you done acid? I did like a little bitty piece of one. I, I was too scared. Yeah, to, you were freaked like, out, go right? Go exactly. somewhere and not come back. Exactly. For a day, See you the you know? same way. So where did that come oh. from? That wasn't that. That's not a money thing. You're thinking of like, yeah, because you you're funny. You live in your mind. You want to be present. I, I always had a kind of pragmatism where I was always trying to talk all my friends out of doing crazy shit that that's they great. would suffer for. You know, the following day or be incarcerated even, or something. Even like when that. you were little. Yeah, like like I'm um, a little, you know, twelve, thirteen. I mean, that's a good friend, right? I I I wish that my kids have friends like that. I was I was down. I, I remember one time uh, when I was about seventeen, and we used to break into the Mulholland Club up on the top of Mulholland here in L.A., and they had a tennis club and a swimming pool and and stuff like that. And so our thing was nobody belonged to the club, but we would break in after closing and when we broke in we'd have skinny dipping parties and we'd yeah. run around and we'd tear the place up and we'd go nuts and then so one time we thought well you know be really fun is if we could climb up to the three story roof of the club that was over the pool and it wasn't jump. right over the pool you had to clear about 10 feet of, yeah. of slab but but if you got it you'd hit the pool and that seemed like some cheap thrills for us and we all got up on the roof and uh, there were about four or five guys, and everyone was naked, and it was at night, and, you know, we've been drinking <laughs> beer. And the pool, you know, the roof, it's a flat roof, but it's got a little parapet, like a little eight-inch rim that goes around it. Like, when yeah. you look up and you see what you think is a flat roof, you're looking at a parapet. Mm-hmm. It, it right. drops down. So I was like, look, we're going to have to get a, a little bit of a running start to clear the slab to make the pool. And... uh Keep in mind, there's a para, you know, the parapet here. Like if somebody trips over that parapet, they're going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of their life. And we're all 17, you know. Anyway, I was right in the middle of my safety speech, and my buddy Todd just went sailing past me naked, like right in the middle of the speech. And then everyone else just went sailing past me as well. And I was like, well, I tried to give this, you know, I tried to give the safety I speech. Lo- I, I, I hope that my 
my children, I have three children who are, you know, in their late teens and early 20s that they have a friend like that. My daughter just uh, sent me, well, it's not just, she sent me a year ago. Uh, she's at university and she sent me a picture where she's next to a uh, young woman uh, who is holding a gallon of, have you, do you know what a Borg is? Mm-hmm. No, I do, yeah. Yeah, see, you guys know what it is. I didn't know what this is. I know they, what a Borg is either. Well, it's, it's written, they write Borg on their gallon of water, and it's a blackout rage gallon. <laughs> and so this is what... This wow. Is, okay, but Adam, you could go... I know Adam could go for 20 minutes on this. Basically, this is where we've got at university. These young women, they want to party, right? As they should, as, as young kids want to. They want to go. They want to have a good time. They've seen all these movies. They want to go off to college. They want a good time. They take a... A gallon, they buy a gallon of whatever Poland spring water. They pour out uh, half of it. They pour in uh, half a Gatorade or whatever. And then they pour vodka into that. And they keep the cap on there so that they don't get roofied. Mm. So they know that they can drink Uh. all day with their blackout. And they're right. It's a blackout rage gallon. Now, I don't know (laughs) what you're going to do once you're blacked out. But I have said to my daughter, please, don't ever drink a blackout rage gallon. And... Thank wow, you. <laughs> it's 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 pragmatic because it has electrolytes <laughs> in it, yeah, and it's got a cap. And yeah. you know, I I just heard uh, P Diddy's bouncer talking. I don't know if anyone caught this, but you know, you know when people get really specific, and you go like, "Oh, that's really specific," like like you, you could make that shit up. Uh-huh. Yeah, he he'd say. Because he was talking about roofies all the time and roofing all the chicks and all that stuff. And he goes, we didn't put the roofies in the booze. We put the roofies in the mix. We put the roofies in the orange juice and the cranberry juice. And they'd, it'd be in the juice. And then they'd just say to the chick, yeah, go ahead and make a sea breeze, you know, or, or a screwdriver. <laughs> and she'd pour the juice. And then you'd go, yeah, here's the vodka. And she'd just pour the vodka and go, oh, Okay. I made it myself. Wait a minute. This just came out like the last two days? I saw him interviewed on like TMZ, I think, Chris. You see TMZ last night? I did. Oh, wasn't he on TMZ last night? They they talked about his house getting raided. I don't remember seeing a bounce. Oh, there's it was a, Jesse Waters. Oh, was it Jesse yeah, Waters was last there. night? I, I watched Jesse, Jesse Waters. I watched TMZ and I got him confused. Oh, it was on Jesse Waters. Yeah, but... I think so. When you oh, hear... Yeah, Jesse Waters are the freak out parties. Right? Uh, the, really specific shit... That makes sense. You go, oh, he's probably not lying. Yeah, because who's ever even thought about that? So like, the blackout yeah. jug is great until somebody decides to butt funnel it all at once, <laughs> <laughs> and then there's trouble. <laughs> Lenny, ever do a butt funnel? Uh, no. That's the no. only thing you haven't done. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, you Days, know, yeah. I could, Wait, the uh, butt I, funnel I, is I, when they pour it. Down. It's right in the name. Yeah, it's yeah, like it's toaster oven. It's right yeah. there. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's I right there. <laughs> what's that box do? It's a toaster oven. But what's it do? Well, it's an oven that also... I'm still trying to figure it out. It, you do it... it so so I'll look it up. Na- so naive, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's insane. But... I, I I I I only did uh, the acid a few times, but what what ended it for me was uh, we were, we were at the thing hole with the duck, and we you know <laughs> we, I, I forgot about it. And, and someone told me that shouldn't kill the duck and put it on the menu. I went what? So I felt I felt like I was you know a murderer. I killed the duck. I didn't want to kill him. I mean I liked him, but he's gone. But you know? wow. Well. You know, he could get drunk and start talking at the park. <laughs> and the next thing you know, we got a situation. <laughs> All right. Well, wait a minute. So You so, killed the duck? <laughs> yeah. Wait, no, I didn't. I had. I didn't. Yeah. I want to ask Adam this. So so you're you're the practical guy. You're you're pragmatic. Have you ever had to, like, be sober when you had a friend who took too much acid and you had to kind of, like, walk him through this? You're not freaking out. Don't, you know. Like, have you ever been in one of those I, I had a, uh, I was the guy who was yelling, dude, maintain, like all the time, oh. you know. Yeah. I had a situation where um, my two roommates were rolling on some acid and brought home two women that I deemed aesthetically to be way beneath them, you know. And uh, 
and I pulled them into the kitchen and I just said, like, I know you guys are, are super high right now, but I don't. I don't think you're going to be happy with this decision, and <laughs> especially uh, if you have kids. With and them. yeah, and I'm going to we're, we're going to need to you know I'm going to intervene here, or whatever. And then I got on the phone with one of my other friends, and I said like We got a situation over here." And then I looked in the living room, and they're both everyone is like half naked, rolling around on the floor. <laughs> and and I just said to my friend, "I'm coming. I'm getting out of here." And I just stepped over all these these bodies and, oh, and left. Yeah, you know? I wish I wish I had someone like you around because uh, <laughs> <laughs> voice of reason. Hey, Lenny, I, I remember it's Lenny. No, 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 Lenny, no. <laughs> I, I brought this girl on one night and we got we were at some house and you know, she got undressed and I said Wow, what did you eat in a cab ride, man? You're huge. <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and I disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. Well then you weren't that high. No. All, right. All right, we need to take a, a quick break. Lenny Clark's going to hang out. And uh, yeah. he's written a children's book. He's going to tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Duck, Duck, No. <laughs> and uh, Mike O'Malley here. Extended Family Season 1, streaming on NBC.com or Peacock as well. We'll do a little bit of news, and we'll do that right after this. Adam and Eve, you want a little better sex? I bet you do. Well, the best way to get started is to go to adamandeve.com. Do it right now. 50% off just about any item, plus free shipping, including rush processing. Doesn't matter how much you spend or what you buy. All will be packaged and sent discreetly, free and fast. That's 50% off one item, free shipping with free rush processing. Just go to adamandeve.com, select any one item, and enter offer code ACE at checkout. That's adamandeve.com. Use the offer code ACE and get the 50% off deal. That's ACE, A-C-E, at adamandeve.com. Am I right, Dawson? This is an exclusive offer specific to this podcast, so be sure to use the code ACE to get your discount. 100% free shipping and get it fast with Rush Processing. Code ACE. Home chef drowning in a sea of meal kit options. It's like a bad dating app. Say goodbye and swipe left to lackluster meals. Home chef, fresh ingredients, fresh design recipes delivered to your doorstep. Over 30 options a week covering a variety of dietary needs the one i tried that i like the most and i've tried a few of them i like the brew pub mustard salmon mm. does that sound good you should check that one out because it sure tasted good classic kits with pre-portioned ingredients speedy recipes ready in less than 30 minutes oven ready kits with pre-chopped ingredients and microwave meals in minutes save an average of 86 bucks per month on groceries. Yeah, you can't get out of the grocery store these days without a couple hundred bucks. Home Chef even has a delicious kid-friendly menu with 18 new options each week. It's Home Chef, right, Dawson? For limited time, Home Chef is offering our listeners 18 free meals plus free dessert for life and, of course, free shipping on your first box. Go to homechef.com slash Adam. That's homechef.com slash Adam for 18 free meals and free dessert for life. You heard that right. Homechef.com slash Adam. Must be an active subscriber to receive the free dessert. It's time for Nicaraguan Name That Movie with Adam's buddy Oswaldo. See if you can guess which movie this famous line is from. My thing is on the floor. If you said... Hoosiers. My team's on the floor. You're correct. Now, back to the show. All right. Lenny Clark is here. <laughs> Mike O'Malley here. Been there. Done that. That should be the name. Oh, that should be the name of your book, Lenny. Not the children's book. No, you know what? Off. Adam, I am going to write a book, but I got to wait for a few more people to die. And mm. uh, the names would change to protect the guilty. Right. But that would be a tale. That would be a tome. All right. Extended Family. Again, season one streaming on NBC.com and Peacock as well. John Cryer is in this. John Cryer used to be my neighbor. Super sweet guy. A great yeah. guy. Phenomenal actor. I mean, just incredible, unbelievable yeah. guy. 
Yeah. yeah. Sweet. You, you, you meet these guys who have that much success and have been around as long as him. And he's just, yeah, he's just a nice guy. And But he's really, really funny. Really funny and hardworking. Did yeah. you, uh, on a on a sober note for a change here, I, I, <laughs> I know you did Yes, Dear, and I know you worked with Alan Kirschenbaum yeah, love, all those years. Yeah, yes. Great guy. I worked with him on a pilot or two. Yep. I got to know him, yeah, as you do in those situations where yeah. you just you sit in the same room and eat Great lunch day. for 12 yeah. hours a day, and right? And he killed himself, and yeah. I could never figure it out. Great wow. guy, great laugh, everything going for him uh, was... Um, Freddie Roman's son. Yeah, Freddie Roman's uh, stand-up comedian. Stand-up comedian yeah. and, and uh, you know, famous guy. And he, uh, Alan was, so it was Alan and Greg Garcia. They created Yes, Dear. And then Greg went on to create My Name is Earl and Raising Hope yeah. and Sprung and The Guest Book. And, you know, he, Greg helped me out on the sitcom because, you know, he's so talented and he's a great friend. But I remember him calling me. So, you know, we did six years of yesteryear. It's, it's uh, you know, this is back in the days when there was only, you know, whatever, five networks, six, six networks and uh, that were doing comedies. And we made, you know, six seasons of this. It, it was a pressure for the – it's pressure for the writers in a way that it isn't – I think it, just having acted on that, it was just fun. It's a fun – uh, it's a fun show, and then he would—he was a guy to go to. I, I remember he was developing that um, that that show with you, and he and I, you know, Greg called me, um, you know, the morning that he, you know, passed away. He was just struggling with de- depression, and I think it is a, I think it is a, you know, it's a very real thing that when it happens to people, my cousin described it as a. You know, literally a black wave, you know, just a wave of just it just it just comes over you. And um, I think it's, you know, somebody described once depression to me is, is that it, what's insidious about it is that it turns you against yourself. And I had never heard that before. Yeah. And I think that it's what happens. I don't know what your opinion is. The on, exact on... opposite of the Miami Coke. I'll tell you that <laughs> right now. The exact. <laughs> you want to describe what Miami Coke is? The, the opposite, opposite of, yeah, exactly. of, of that. Yeah, yeah. You look at yourself in the mirror in the Miami Coke. You're like, I love this guy. I uh, I loved Alan. And, you know, least likely guy to ever take his own life. Yes. In, in my opinion. So that means it's all, you know, anybody's a potential candidate. And and also, I really love the guy, and I. My lament is, everyone who's killed themselves, I really like, and all the people I hate won't kill themselves. <laughs> yeah, I know yeah. so many people I wish would just kill themselves, and yet here they are. Have you ever have you ever bungee jumped? No. Well, I had gone to this you know party with the you know they had a bungee jump, and you go up on the crane, and it was it was you know starting to become popular. People would go down to. Uh, you know, Australia, New Zealand, and they, they, this, they had this, and they all come back. You know, you they're traveling around, jump off the bunch. So this is this is probably eighty nine, ninety, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna go try. I'm gonna go try this, and uh, I jumped off. And the second I jumped off, I said, anyone who's ever committed suicide by jumping off a bridge has said five seconds after they've jumped, this is a terrible mistake. <laughs> oh, they uh, say it a tenth of a second. Yeah, it's documented. Oh, really? Yeah. Everybody who jumps off the Golden Gate Bridge and survives, not too many, but some do. Yeah, there's a documentary. Yeah. Their first impulse is, I wish I was back on that bridge. Instant regret. Instant regret. Ah. Yeah. 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 So that's what I was like, you know, I mean, maybe there's a thing where you could create just like, ah. But you know, I, I don't know how much of that is pure sort of chemical. Like right. like when the human body is free falling, no matter what your state is, it's a crazy adrenaline thing and, a, and a, an attempt to live, you yeah. know. But um, all right, what the hell we're we talking about? Should we do a little news? Yeah, we can. Sure. Sorry for uh, taking that detour, but uh, I love that guy, Kirschenbaum. Um, Green guy. So former President Donald Trump, who uh, you just ran into uh, over the weekend, Adam, he suggested in an interview that Prince Harry could be deported in mm. light of concerns about his visa eligibility given his past drug use. Mm. So he's not getting any special treatment mm-hmm. if, uh, if Trump has his way. I think we'd be a better nation without those two. Because <laughs> I, I, I don't, I really need to get her out of here. 
And <laughs> he, it, it'd be nice if he went, but it'd be great if she went. And if we deport him, she'll have to follow. Yeah. And then, well, and then we can get rid of both wait, of wait, them. Wait, wait, yeah. wait a minute. Why? <laughs> I, I, well, first off, I hate anybody who's in a position of extreme privilege who makes themselves into a victim. She's a person who lives a wildly privileged life who never stops talking about victimhood and, you know, her race and all that kind of stuff. I, I think she's kind of a race hustler. Uh, she's also this new breed of circle talker. She doesn't say anything. She just talks about a seat at the table and going to your, you know, being your best self and all this. There's way too many of these sort of Michelle Obamas and Oprah's and stuff out there where they're constantly just saying nothing. They're circle talkers. I, I call them the sort of word salad. Wait, they're saying people. nothing. Well, if you look, you can watch, um, Michelle Obama and Oprah do a one hour special, which I have, and they don't say anything. They talk about you raising yourself up and being your best version of you. And it it's nothing. You know, you need something like do 18 push-ups every morning and, uh, and, and, and drink a raw egg, you know, smoothie or something. <laughs> I, too, too much. That's pragmatic. Ace, pragmatic. Right That's there. pragmatic. So you're, That's you're asking. Well, uh, you're, you're asking. Uh, You'd be down with Michelle Obama and Oprah if they just gave a, a few more uh, how tos. I mean, yeah, it, I'd be down if they if I they think said. That, but I actually think that I think that, if they said like, listen, if you're gonna if you're chasing the dragon and you got to tie off, <laughs> don't put that filthy piece of tubing in your mouth. Just carry some rubbing alcohol. Carry some Purell. <laughs> wipe it down, or have a friendly junkie help you. There's no shame in two handed tie offs. <laughs> <laughs> it's we're, not we're, training we're, wheels. Don't listen to the what, other junkies. I'm, you know what? I'm I'm very upset about my drug use. Caused me to miss out on my white privilege. Yes. If someone had told me That's I right. had the white privilege, I could have had a happy life. I yep. would have been pulled over by the cops. Excuse me. I'm white. <laughs> Go to the movies. Go to the movies. You can't judge me. I'm white. But now. The white privilege is gone, and now we are the problem. You snorted all your white privilege, my brother. I <laughs> certainly did, and I've learned my lesson. I have licked the boot. Lenny, tell the story about driving 100 miles an hour down the uh, interstate with uh, Stephen Wright. Oh, my God. We're doing a show. Oh, I forgot Carl. about Stephen Wright. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Free kid, nice kid. And um, we're working in Orono, Maine, which is hundreds of miles away from Boston, and... Uh, he said, uh, Lenny, you're not staying tonight. I said, no. He said, can I go home with you? I go, yeah, no problem. So we get in, and, I, and you, know, you like to drive fast, Adam. I was going pretty good. I was going 90, you know, and he's going, we're going really fast. I go, don't worry about it. Everything's fine. And then all of a sudden, I see an accident on the other side of the road. I go, bingo. So now I bury it. We're doing 110, 115. He's going, are you out of your mind? I go, no. Any cop worth his salt is going to be at that accident. Right. And if we get grabbed by a cop, I'm going to say, thank God you stopped me. I was looking to tell you about this accident back then. There's <laughs> some bodies everywhere. <laughs> so we made it back. We went to work the next night. And he said, uh, I drove home from Maine with Lenny Clark last night. It took us eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> He's all good. right, what else we got, um, Max Ben? So you remember that we story? We got extended family. I'm sorry. I've yeah. been b b bullsh b This extended family. That's right. Not, I, it, what a show. The right is a fantastic. You got Mike running the show. This thing is incredible. Yeah, Lenny, Donald they're going to cut this out. Let them do the news. They're going to cut this <laughs> oh, out. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I get carried away. So uh, you remember that mom from... Uh, it was a story last year where she wrote a children's book about how to cope with grief after her husband died. Morg. And it, was, it may have been a <laughs> but, it, but then it came out that the husband died because he was poisoned with a lethal dose of fentanyl mm. that the woman yeah. served him. Mm -hmm. so, oh, I didn't know about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, it's now being reported that she is getting an additional charge. She's facing an additional charge of attempted murder because she allegedly drugged him. Uh, on Valentine's Day, day with a sandwich. Mm. And so they're going through his old text and he's texting his friends going, I don't feel good. I'm breaking out in hives. I have to, I had to use my kid's EpiPen. I had to go, the, I have to go to the hospital. 
And um, well, sorry, hold on. This is on him because <laughs> any woman I've ever been with, if she said, "I made you a sandwich," I'd be like, "Okay, let me check this what's sandwich. Going what, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> You've never made me a sandwich. Oh, man. Soup. I, I could buy soup if it was canned. <laughs> that I would buy. But the sandwich, sorry. Now, does, does she get? Does she get another book deal? <laughs> So you you're you never had a girlfriend uh, who made you a sandwich? Uh, <laughs> that's come on, that's you're exaggerating. Uh, never a hot sandwich like a Diablo or French dip or anything. <laughs> yeah, like, like some, a peanut butter and jelly. That's some like bologna and American cheese. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nothing well, I like. That. I had, yep, I had the bologna American cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, she tried to kill the guy twice? Yeah. So this obviously this attempt failed because he texted his friend, said he wasn't feeling good, and mm-hmm. um. And they found all these old texts and then came to the conclusion, like, oh, she tried to poison him then. It didn't work. And then eventually later on, she does it with a Moscow mule. Um, no. Yeah, and that's how she, that's how she well, was able to I do always it. wonder what was in a Moscow mule. Yeah. I just like that it has its own cup. Every <laughs> cup other drink yeah. just gets a glass, but not the Moscow mule. A copper musk. Somebody's got to go to a foundry. <laughs> when, when, <laughs> <laughs> I want <wonder>, to... <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they're ever out of the copper cup and you go, just put it in a tumbler, bitch. And you're like, sorry, <laughs> rules are rules. Well, what's amazing about the, uh, the you're, you're surprised when you drink out of the copper mug, you're like, why am I not drinking every cold drink yes. out of this copper mug? Yes, it feels regal. Why don't we figure out, a? this should be a Adam Carolla show, drink that's made out of some other sort of metallic well, maybe that's a power move. Maybe right. the next time you're at a bar, you order a Greyhound, but you demand it's in a copper cup. Yeah. You go, I want the Moscow Mule cup, yeah. but I'll just take the vodka and soda or whatever and they say it is. it's two bucks more. You're like, for what? It's, it, it, I, was, it's I, cool. I drank with Mr. T, and he had his chalice with him. Oh, he did. Yeah, he did. man. Black yeah. guys have, they travel with their own chalice. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. When when I come on, name more than one. <laughs> well, okay. okay are you, you ready? <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Are you ready? <laughs> Just I mean, talk about a global statement. <laughs> this is right up there with Michelle and Oprah have never said anything you know the- to help people. We also have we also have this. Those people with their vertical leap, their big penises, and their chalices. I hey Byron, you got to find me and Jimmy and the Bishop Don Magic Juan. I mean, you can just find a, a photo of us traveling because I I traveled with the uh, you know the gentleman of leisure, the Bishop Don Magic Juan, and he traveled with his own chalice as well. And whatever he went, he said, "Make it in this." He yeah. he 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 drove his car. That's how he drinks his Borgs. I asked him like <laughs> I asked him if he'd ever been pulled over for an open chalice <laughs> because he's. <laughs> Driving around with a chalice, and I don't know how it works with the cops, but if you drive around with you know the bottle of tequila in your hand, you're going to get pulled over. Yes, or yeah. a, a Budweiser. There he is. There he is. Uh, what is that. in his left hand, Mike? A chalice. Yeah. All right, it's a chalice. It right. looks like the Holy well, Grill. Right someone there. owes me an <laughs> apology. Like Holy I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, Ace. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. it. That's. I apologize. He has a chalice. And he's, <laughs> he's drinking out of it. And every that's a nice picture. That yeah, it's a nice chalice. Oh, yeah. I was an altar boy. I've I've not seen chalices that beautiful. Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> Very ornate. All right, sorry. Oh yeah, and when Moscow mules were were all the rage, you um you had to submit like if you go to a bar, you had to trade your ID for a for a mug. Oh. You don't get it back till you give that oh, copper uh, mug. Back. Wow. Oh, yeah, that's very interesting. Nice. They're expensive. That's well, you have to go to the foundry. <laughs> <laughs> have I haven't heard the word foundry. <laughs> I, I, I haven't heard, heard that since, since I time traveled to 1912. <laughs> oh. All right, what so else? There's a, a Los Angeles man being who has been convicted of dozens of felonies for violently extorting karaoke businesses in Koreatown mm. using uh, methods that... Lenny's probably seen his mob friends <laughs> use. He would go around with a baseball bat wow. and threaten, threaten these businesses demanding protection money. Mm. And, I mean, he's physically attacked some of them. He's, he's stolen one of their cars. He's just an old-school gangster going after these karaoke bars. Finally has been convicted. See, the um, way to do it without violence 
and without conviction is you just go in and you talk to the manager and you go, look, I'm going to tell every human being who comes in here, I'll pay them $10 if they sing Summer Lovin'. <laughs> over and over and over, and this place is going to be a ghost town Psychological in two days. Warfare. Now, do you want that? Because <laughs> if want not, that? I'm going to need a little bit of cash. That's how you clear out a karaoke <laughs> bar. You do three summer lovins in a row from Greece, oh. and that's that's Bump. it. Is the guy singing both parts? <laughs> yeah, I'll have one fat dude doing both parts, <laughs> and this place is going to clear out quick. That's a threat. <laughs> no more Moscow mules being rung up when these people clear out of this place. They still have karaoke bars, huh? Yeah, especially in the Asian community. You like rent out rooms. Asians are strange because they're they're very buttoned down in many facets. And then the next thing you know, they're either you know wearing a three piece suit and bowing, or they're eating sushi off a naked person. You know, it's kind of which which is it? You know what I mean? Socially, with the, with range. I'll go, I'll go this, for a naked person, please. Okay. Where, where is the where is where are these places? I want to go to the naked town. naked town. sushi is still a thing. No, no, no. I don't. Well. I, I think if you throw a big enough party, I'll bet you Puff Daddy had a few naked sushi parties. Yeah, but were they women? <laughs> or oh, men? I don't know. Do you believe all the the Diddy stuff going on? I mean, you saw the you said you saw the report yesterday, and it it's it's hard to hear about that much smoke. You know what I mean? Without any fire, like it just a feels like how he hired. I mean, he had to run and everyone had to sign NDAs, and then he had all these drugs, and then he had a camera in every room, and then this is what I'm everyone. I'm glad did. I never got invited to the party. I'm glad. Yeah. Yes. I'm happy. You would have blended right in. <laughs> oh yeah, the white body. I would have. I would have went naked. It. There was a lot of. That was a very coordinated. It, it's, there was a lot of people showing up and taking a lot of stuff out of there, which is oh yeah. You, know, you feel as if somebody, you know, clearly, I don't know, maybe they maybe they were. All right, caught, let's let's right? just let's play this game. All right, okay. Lenny, yeah. I don't know how your family of origin was, but I'm guessing not great based on, you know, what I've heard for the last <laughs> forty minutes. Um, <laughs> no, he's, how many? Kids? He's got a sister. Who's a, wait, you got no? You, I, do you have a sister? Who's a nun? Uh, no, no, no. no. You, got, you came I, from I, seven? Seven, right? I have seven brothers and sisters. I had an aunt that was a nun and an uncle that was a brother. You know, it's like a step yeah. below a priest, I guess. Right. I don't uh, all right, so here's the hypothetical. All right. Um, I come from, you know, some food stamps and some TV dinners and broken down yeah. cars and not, not, no fun. No air conditioning. Black and no. white 13-inch oh, yeah. Zenith TV. You know what I mean? Yeah. And not, not a lot of good times. Okay. Um, I don't know, Mike, where you come from. I come from uh, New Hampshire. My parents are still married. Mm. Hardworking. That's why folks. you're so straight. Yeah. It's, uh, but but know. not a party. Not a no. party. No. Uh, we had a TV, and, but it didn't have a TV. Uh, wait, 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 right. wait, 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 you had to change show. the channels with pliers. <laughs> right? My father oh, yeah, at one yeah, point. Yeah. This is just saying that my father at one point was so tired that when he just, he would just have a bowl of Cheerios before he, he worked for uh Sanders Associates, which is, you know, a defense company. And, but he would get, you know, there's four of us. And, uh, you know, you forget when you're growing up, you know, now you think about it and people are like, oh, interest rates are terrible. Mm -hmm. It's like they were like 18% when oh, we yeah. were growing up oh, in the, the world. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so, oh, yeah. uh, you know, he was so tired of, uh, there being no milk for his Cheerios, we started to have that, you know, he'd buy a gallon of milk, <laughs> unlike the blackout rage gallon, pour half out, put the powder, yeah, the powder, and yeah. then you'd have two gallons. Step on it. Yeah, That's exactly. why I need that Miami See, milk. I just, I just, I know, that I, I love that you knew exactly where I was going with it. People right. would, my kids would be horrified if I took out a box of carnation powder oh, milk, oh, yeah. mixed it, <clears throat> tap water. All right, yeah. so here's the hypothetical. Chris, I knew you grew up, you know, no great digs. Either hearing some of your stories, sure. Uh, my my parents were lazy and broke, and you know, no one ever <laughs> bought a new piece of furniture, you know, in my entire life, and the whole nine years. Never, away. never been on an airplane, much less a private jet or any any of. Never, never went anywhere. Never did anything. All right, <clears throat> but you know, everyone's free. They're not incarcerated now. All right. right. Would you take um, your shit? Poor, broke-ass childhood uh, where nothing ever happened and no toys were ever bought, no travels ever had, 
but your parents, you know, they're on the straight and narrow. Or like P. Diddy's kids, 0 to 18, 0 to 20, private jets, parties, biggest celebrities in the world, like babysitting you. You know, Justin Bieber's playing acoustic set for you, you know, in your in your living room, and then hold off to prison when you're going off to college. No, never. I take never. the good 18 years. I take I take the party. You, you wouldn't. Would. Oh, no, yeah. you wouldn't. You're I'm done with them. I'm going off. No. That's heroin. That's you're lying. You're saying that now. You're, you're, you're Lenny's you're with not. me. Lenny's with me. I send no. flowers. No. Yeah. But <laughs> that's right. The that's right. I take it. That's I right. That's why I'm elderly. We're talking private jets. You're, yeah. you're, you're, not a chance. You're, you're the one who's telling people not to jump over the parapet. You're the pragmatic <laughs> guy. What you're happened? saying, by the way, you're naked with three other guys on a roof <laughs> and saying, guys, watch the distance here. I don't want you to trip. You and are scrape taking, your dick. Okay? Right. But you're saying, I'm just going to book. All right. Let me try this, Mike. <laughs> it's your ninth birthday. I'm not You're doing getting it. on a private jet with 10 of your favorite friends. And yep. you're going to David Copperfield's island. Oh. No. No, you're no. going on Magic Johnson's no. yacht no. With, with him and, and uh, Steve Harvey. Uh, I'm no. You, you All are right, who zero he, to 20. Zero. You, Find out his oldest kid. Find out P. Diddy's oldest kid. Let's up the ante a right, little. Let me I ask do you it. this. Who is, a re- is the son or daughter of a really wealthy person who, is, who has succeeded like you on their own? Mm, man, that'd be that. It'd be hard pressed. I mean, um, made made, you their, got made their own way. Anderson own... Cooper. Okay, that's <laughs> all I got. But he turned out to be gay, so you know, that's a bust. His mother was famous, right? Gloria Vanderbilt. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Thirty. All right, his oldest son is thirty. Oldest wow. child, sir. Would you take thirty now? No. Zero to thirty, Chris. No. No. You didn't. Lenny, you're in, right? I'm in. Private jets, caviar, David oh, Copperfield's yeah. Island, boats with yeah. Magic Johnson and Steve Harvey. New stewardesses. New dude stewardesses, eating sushi off of naked women. Um, yeah. Yeah, know, but see, you acoustic were, you, sets in your living room by every big name platinum selling uh, artist in the world. And all, yo, yo, ma. But, 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 yo, yo. Your, your yeah. friends. Oh, 32 is this oldest kid. Ooh. Oh, your friends when you, you were now. growing Don't up think with about it, Chris. <laughs> yeah. your shenanigans, which is making your buddy do a rail of you know baking soda. That's yeah. your shenanigans back then. Yeah, I didn't make him do it. All I right. just didn't tell him it was See? baking soda. It's, okay, <laughs> you said, "All right, him. you want to do didn't this? You Probably got, better for him." Did it hurt him? It's fine. Him uh, These guys are all your friends because they're your friends. Every time he coughed, it smelled like a fresh refrigerator. <laughs> He's a chef now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we but got we got okay. Let's agree to disagree. I want to keep going, on, no, I to keep going to on this. I just don't believe that Adam Carolla. Knowing 32, who you are, 32. No. Oh hell yeah! Private jets. <laughs> are you dead? But yeah, yeah, but then you're I in prison dead, the rest I, of your life. I didn't try. I didn't. Are you in prison? I the rest didn't of your eat life? a piece of shrimp until I was like 36 and a half. <laughs> Did you like it? Yes, a lobster, <laughs> shrimp, sushi. It was all in my 30s. I never got on a plane before yeah. I was 30. I mean, this is private jets. These are oh. islands. These are moguls. I bet I those pro- kids are complaining about their childhood in a way, too. Probably like saw Whitney Houston naked twice, you know, oh. just getting out of the hot tub or something back in the yeah. day. Yeah. I don't know. Lenny, you're with me, right? I am. All okay. the way. Okay. I'll drive. <laughs> no, it's not it's just a hypothetical. It's not on the table. Oh, okay. uh, right. Let's give a plug. <laughs> Extended family. Yes. Yeah. 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 Listen, yeah. No, I, I, Adam, thank you for having us on the show. But believe me, because I am so happy to be working with Mike O'Malley. He he runs a great ship. I'm telling you, from the from the head to the bottom, everyone on the show is happy. Everyone wants to be there. You know, there's a lot of people involved, and uh, and they all love what they're doing. You know, to go to work with people that love what they're doing, that's amazing. Because uh, a lot of times I went to places I hated everyone. I agree, and it was uh, vice versa. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
All I'm right. telling you, say anything sincere. <laughs> so I'd say something sincere. I'm just waiting for Adam to hammer it down. <laughs> I'm just saying it. Just try it. I don't even think it's if, if there's one second in between that, you're never going to be quicker than this guy. Oh, sure. <laughs> hey, he's. We've heard about his past. He's lost a few brain cells. But Lenny in his prime, Lenny in his prime was as sharp a knife as there was in the drawer. Lenny, when was your sitcom? You you had your own sitcom. It was called Lenny. Yeah, they're going to colorize it. It was, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it was in 19, uh, 1990. Oh, I was big. Oh, oh I yeah. Had boards. I had Lenny lunchboxes. I was the guy. And the ratings were probably uh, higher than Game of Thrones now, right? When you, the, the ratings were amazing. We had good ratings. We what, had great ratings. What happened? The war broke out. The goddamn war broke out. Yeah. And, and, and so <clears throat> my life. Damn Japs bombed Pearl Harbor and <laughs> <laughs> I'm just busted when he shops again. <laughs> All right. Wolf Blitzer becomes a hit and Lenny is just doing Extended Family A NBC.com or Peacock. Love these guys. Come back anytime. Give my love to John. Love, Thanks, Ace. Love uh, that Thanks guy. Thanks so much. Yeah. Ricky Thanks. Rackman, a blast Thanks, from Ricky the Rackman. past is going to come in here, and we'll talk all about the old days right after this. Just thrive. Life can be overwhelming, and it's not just your mind that suffers. Stress messes with your digestive system and immune system, too. Just Calm, the breakthrough, new stress-busting formula from Just Thrive. It's an exclusive mood-lifting blend and it's clinically proven to help you relax and breathe easier in as little as four weeks. And I love the award-winning Just Thrive Probiotic. I take it every day. It's part of my routine, and I wouldn't stop taking it. I feel better. My head's better. My gut's better. You'll feel the difference. It's a spore probiotic with 1,000 times better survivability than most probiotics. Banishes bloat and constipation. So your gut can produce more serotonin, your happy hormone. Plus, it supports better sleep, all with a money-back guarantee. It's Just Thrive, right, Dawson? Right now, when you go to JustThriveHealth.com and use promo code ADAM, you can get 20% off a 90-day bottle of Just Thrive Probiotic and Just Calm. That's like getting a month for free. And a portion of every purchase goes to Vitamin Angels, a nonprofit organization that saves the lives of millions of children and moms-to-be around the world by ensuring they get the vitamins and minerals they need to stay healthy and strong. To learn more about this groundbreaking company, don't miss Adam's interview with Tina Anderson, founder of Just Thrive. Take control today with Just Thrive. On the Jordan Harbinger Show, you'll hear amazing stories from people that have lived them, from spies to CEOs, even an undercover agent who infiltrated the Gambino crime family. You're about to hear a preview of the Jordan Harbinger Show with Jack Garcia, who did just that. My career was 24 out of 26 years, was solely dedicated working undercover. I walk in, I'm in the bar. Now there's a barmaid there, good looking young lady. She's serving me drink. Hey, what would you like? I usually, my drink was, give me a kettle, one martini, three olives, glass of water on the side. I finish the drink. The guys come in. I'm going to go, go in my pocket, take out the big wad of money. Bam, I give her $100. If you're with the mob, I say, hey, Jordan, you're on record with us. That means we protect you. Nobody could shake you down. We could shake you down, but you're on record with us. For more on how Jack became so trusted in the highest levels of the Gambino organization, check out episode 392 of The Jordan Harbinger Show. In honor of Jim Carolla's 92nd birthday, here's a list of all the things Adam Carolla will do before he dies. Have a blind woman drag her hands down his face and announce that he's beautiful just one of the things Adam will do before he dies. Let's get back to the Adam Carolla Show. Well, Ricky Rackman is in the studio. Uh, Ricky, you know from MTV, Headbangers Ball, probably. That was a big hit on MTV. Loveline as well. Um, and many other endeavors. Uh, Ricky's a valley guy, right? Um, I grew up in the valley and moved to Hollywood pretty early. So I yeah I guess Van Nuys Van Nuys no yep. nobody North Hollywood yeah Van Nuys nobody brags about Van Nuys we were talking about it yesterday <laughs> you sure. Van Nuys yeah what would you talk what uh, would you have to talk about there's nothing in Van Nuys um, Paul Abdul went to Van Nuys High 
Okay. That's and all when, I got. And when I went to high school, I believe the guys in Shalimar, Jeannie Francis from General Hospital went to my, and there's this list of all these people. And I was just like curious, like the list of, in Wikipedia is like all these people that went to high school at Grant High. My name's not on there. So oh, I didn't even, and it was like, made it was like list. a guy that, you know, third place in a hot dog eating contest. And it's like, and no Ricky no, Rackman. No Ricky Rackman. The podcast called Ricky Rackman's Cat House Hollywood Podcast. Cast. Cat House Hollywood Podcast. Cat House Hollywood Podcast. Yes. Cat House, so that's something you started early, yes. right? Yes. In 1986, I opened up a rock and roll club with my then roommate, Tammy Down, who's the singer of a band called Fast Pussycat. And it was like this rock and roll dance club that was just really like so much decadent stuff happened there. And then one band asked to play, can we just play here one night? And that band was Guns N' Roses. And they wow. became our house band. Is that so 86, then, 87? Yes, sir. It was 87, and then every band just wanted to play our club from, like, you know, Pearl Jam to Black Crows to Megadeth Motorhead. Every band played the Cat House. It became truly world famous, and, you know, it was something we just opened up as a rock and roll dance club. To me. I mean, I still own an apparel company that sells Cat House merchandise all over the world, and it's crazy because, you know— most of the, you know, we've made more in t-shirts than we ever did in the club, you know? And it was really, it was, it was sad because this is an era that they'll never, ever be able to duplicate. No. Um, now it makes me think about Rodney Bingenheimer. Yes. I was his club. That was before my time. That he had a, the, the London Rocker, club or the London club yeah. or something. And he started Rodney, Rodney on the rock started one in Hollywood and like David Bowie and all the luminaries would come by we had david i mean our club was which is funny i just i just went on tour just going and telling stories up on stage for two and a half hours and some of the stories that we tell about in the cat house was the time that axel rose chased david bowie around the cat house saying he was going to kill him and just really? great oh god we got so many great stories that happened there and uh yeah so but i mean you're right it, it, here's a here's an analogy, and let's see if we can figure this out. Uh, yeah, Rodney Bingenheimer's English Disco. Yeah. Oh, that. you're right. Yes. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So I was someone wrote it on my screen, so it's not me. But so here's an analogy. If you look at all these great old boxing pictures from the '40s and the '30s and the '50s, they were black and white. And all the people in the sta- all the people in the arena were smoking cigars. Right. So you have these great black and white pictures of these guys with this haze and the lights pushing through it, and you could never recapture that. Everything's digital. Everything's color, and there's no more smoking. So it's like a bygone era. You could say it's better, or it's worse. It's just we're not going to see it again. And I feel the same way with a lot of these clubs that we're talking about your club or many others like it just we we cannot reproduce it and we can't recapture it it was or replicate I'm, I'm, it. you're absolutely right and it was you know when i say it was just sex drugs rock and roll it really really was i mean in in hallways and everything and and we talk about it very lightly but yeah we lost a lot of people there's a lot of bad things that happened but it's a time that what I always say, and I, I mean, I guess I can't help but everything I talk about, I sound like an old man, like back in the day, but people used to put effort into going out, whether it was, you know, getting dressed up and getting drunk and hanging with their friends and everybody would go out. Now, just like, like people don't put any effort into their entertainment. They it's, don't put in any effort into anything. It's the same as flying. People used to get dressed up to go on a plane. Right. Now it's just right. like flip flops and sweatpants and a fucking white beard. Exactly. Like, like we're just done putting any effort into into anything. And yeah, your time, I always say the best time in this nation's history was right when you opened that club, which is pre-AIDS, mid-Coke. AIDS wasn't invented. Coke wasn't bad for you. Right. And it was just a fucking party. Yes. And I remember when when AIDS virus broke out and the, the big news about it when Freddie Mercury died was the Cat House fifth anniversary. So everybody said, well, who can we talk about, talk to that had like, you know, promiscuous sex and does drugs? Oh, let's go talk to the people at the Cat House. So they came talk to us about Freddie Mercury dying of AIDS. And I was like, well, there haven't been any heterosexual people. How stupid I was then. But there haven't been any heterosexual people dying of AIDS. So we're not really worried about it here. And, you know, just some dumb kid commenting on it. But, yeah, the dangers was just how we lived, you know. How did you start a club when you were 22 I had, I had or any, something? Honestly, 
it was just like convincing the Osco's disco, which was a set of Thank God It's Friday, with the, the place is gone. And it was like this dilapidated club. And I'm like, hey, let's, we want to have our friends hang out and you guys keep the bar and we'll charge the door. And they had nothing. It was like a ghost town. So they agreed to it. And it started slow, and then it just got bigger and bigger, and then pretty soon, like, Steven Tyler's there, and, you know, Billy Gibbons, and every porn star and stripper in the world, and, you know, the girls showed up because the guys were there, and the guys showed up because there were girls there, and it was it was crazy. You guys had a no camera rule. Right? Yeah, which I kind of now <laughs> regret, but I always said, I don't want any cameras allowed in the cat house so people could do whatever they wanted. So if... You know, people were having sex in the bathroom or doing drugs or doing whatever. It would never come back and haunt them. And it was great, but now I don't have really any pictures. Was uh, Guns N' Roses, when they became the house band, did you say, oh, there's something special about these guys? Or did you even notice? I always thought that Guns N' Roses were too good to make it big. Like, whenever bands get, like, really, really huge, they're just like, yeah, you okay. That's great, huge band. But Guns N' Roses, to me, was always dangerous, and they were they were too good. Like there aren't bands that are really cool that become like the biggest song, except like the Stones in the back in the day. But like you didn't think they would make it big because they were just too cool and too dangerous. And now it's it was weird when I went to a sporting event and they played Welcome to the Jungle, and that was weird to me. I'm like, they're playing Guns and it's like, yeah, they, they sold out the stadium three nights, you know. <laughs> and it's still kind of weird that that era is now like. You know, I'm staying at a at a hotel that's that's very nice, and they've got all these framed pictures of these rock stars. They're all people at the cat house, you know. And I'm like, God, it's so acceptable now of that era when I liked it when it was just like dangerous and dirty. And how did Headbangers Ball come about? Because I was the guy. Oh, okay. Because I was the guy that owned the cat house. Uh, Axel called MTV and tried to set up an audition for me, and and he helped set up the audition. And then Axel's like, hey, when you go to New York, do you want me to go with you? I'm like, okay. So I walked into an audition with Axel, and it doesn't hurt. You know, it didn't right. Because I was terrible. I were they no Guns N' Roses doing. back then? Oh, this was when they were, they were big. Were? Oh. This was 1990, so they were already big. So I walked in with him, and, and you know, they, they said, look, you weren't good, but you were authentic. I was like, okay. And I learned. You know, I learned how to be on TV from... From Headbangers Ball, I learned how to do talk radio for, and interviewing from Loveline. I just had these jobs that I wasn't necessarily skilled for doing, and I just well, I just did it long enough that I kind of figured out what to do. You know what I mean? Well, reps is what you need for on camera interviews, especially. It's a weird it's a weird thing, but you just need so much time in those in that chair. And I, I've really, in my experience, interviewing. Like when you and I worked together <clears throat> and I started, I was from nowhere. I had, I had no reps. I, I was just a construction guy bopping around the valley and I was doing Kevin and Bean's morning show and stuff like that. And I could remember sitting in there with you and I was like, I think I'm funnier than this guy, but I can't interview people. He's interviewing people with a kind of an ease. And I don't know that I'll have that ease because it's invisible you can't really chart it. Um, I feel like I got good at interviewing people 15 years in. Like, I didn't have it in year number three. Uh, I was better, but I didn't have it. But I remember you being really good at talking to these bands. And I, m I remember thinking, that's going to have to be something that I'm going to have to learn because I don't know how to do it. And it's not natural. If you're really good at it, it looks natural. Well, that's what I was going to say. I think to be like, I listened to some of my old interviews when I was on MTV and even starting on like, you know, I don't like listening to love because I was such a cocky son of a bitch. Not that I've changed that much, but I'm mm -hmm. different. But the thing is, the reason that you're so good is I think that what we've learned is to do good interviews, don't do an interview like we're you're not interviewing me right now we're just having a conversation yes. and i think as so long as you learn to interview people you learn like don't interview people have a conversation i don't we don't have a, a stack of cards that says which question when i was in mtv they had told me every question to ask i didn't know what the hell i was doing that was my my first time ever in front of a camera was bam you're on headbangers ball mtv wow you know, so the, I think the way to interview people is not interview people, not have discussions. We're just sitting out. We're friends. We're talking about old days, you know, stuff like that. And I think as you learn not to have do an interview and have conversations, that's when I think 
they become good because that's what you like to listen to. Well, on that subject, a question that only you could answer, which <laughs> is know. the first night I did the show without Ricky. So Ricky and I did Love Line for three or four months. C- can I tell like you that. first? I just you hate to interrupt, me. but I got to tell you a story. So Trip Reeb was the GM at, at KROQ then. And before they brought, I had done Do- Love Line with Dr. Drew for a while. And then three years, and, right? And then, Plus. Yeah. And then Trip comes in, he goes, Well, we're going to bring Adam Carolla in as well because you guys are going to do that TV show together, do the Love Line TV show. And then Trip says, I never forget him saying this. He goes, Well, Ricky, you're just not funny. <laughs> and I was like, Thanks. He goes, And so Reese, he's over at KPD in Arizona. And I went over there, you know, a couple of years ago. I was doing my storytelling show and I played out in Arizona. And he and I told him that. He goes, oh, I never said anything. I'm like, no, you did because it scarred me for life. Like, <laughs> he just said, that, We're bringing in Adam because, Rickley, you're just simply not funny. I almost, I got almost the same version of that, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, they took you aside and they said, Adam, Ricky's simply not funny. <laughs> <laughs> See, that was funny. No, I, uh, Kevin Weatherly called me in number one program director in the world. And he said, up the hall from uh, Trip Reeb. And he said, we, we want you to do Loveline, but we think we want you to do it as your character, Mr. Burcham. And I said, I was a guest on Loveline as Mr. Burcham sometime before that. And I said, Kevin, I don't, I don't think that would work out very well. I think I should do it as myself because uh, it's not, you know, maybe be fun for 20 minutes. That's, right? that's that, not, exactly. Not night in and night out. And he stopped and he goes, we know Mr. Burcham's funny. We don't know if you're funny. <laughs> and I remember thinking, so I got the non-funny speech <laughs> right. too in a sort of aspect. From two of the kind most of non-funny people there yeah, are that's, you know, that's when that's you think true. about it. <laughs> so here's the question. Okay. So I couldn't interview... I wasn't good at interviewing people. I didn't know how to interview people. And I didn't really have to interview people because Ricky would do the interviewing of the band. And Ricky oftentimes had some relationship with the band through MTV or through the Cat House or through some prior relationship. And they'd come in and be hugging it out. Hey, man, it's been a while, you know, and I'd just be sitting there as the comedy guy. You're on the outside. But I, I really couldn't interview people and Ricky was always doing a great job interviewing people and then the night so Ricky left and it was gonna be the first night of me and Drew and now I had to do the interviewing because Drew doesn't do back then especially didn't do anything he just sat there right yeah January of 96 January of 96 so I I went okay I'm pretty nervous about this interview but you can get guys in there like John Popper from Blues Travel and stuff. They're funny, they're gregarious, they're storytellers, and they make it easy. You know, there's David Allen Greer could have been the guest or some comedian I knew or anybody. But I get Psycho Maiko from Suicidal Tendency. <laughs> Who's a really good friend of mine. <laughs> That's right. And Mike just sitting there with his arms crossed the whole time. And I'm like, so what was it like making a record? And he's like, fine. And he'd like lean back <laughs> again, and I'm like, how long do you play the guitar? He'd be like, <laughs> I don't play. And he'd like lean back again, his arms folded. I was like, see this guy, he's like sweating bullets. Right. I'm going, this is the worst interview. He's, he's answering every question with one word. Sometimes you just like nod, you know, like into the microphone, yes or no. And, and I'm like, I couldn't have... This is the worst card I could have drawn. There yeah, were other people yeah. that were friends, other people that were gregarious. I could have got a comedian. I could have got an actress. But I got Psycho Maiko from Suicidal Tendencies. And ever since that day, I was like, was he fucking with me? I mean, I know mm. he's kind of a hard ass, and yeah. I know he's in a punk band and stuff, but he's friends with Ricky. Did Ricky put him up no, to it? No, no. I didn't even, I didn't even, re- I mean, I'm sure. Or was it, then, maybe it was his form of protest. Maybe he wished you were there. I don't, I don't know what it was. I mean, I still talk to Mike and uh, I don't think, I know I wouldn't have said, look, if you're going to be on the show with, <laughs> with Adam and Drew, make sure you give him a hard time. I wouldn't have done that. But 
I don't think I even talked to him. I think I would probably be like, why'd you do the show right when I left or something like that? But no, I didn't even know. I don't even remember It was just that. the worst timing no. ever that- You wouldn't do that. The first no, interview I, I had to no, do. I, I would do that, but I didn't. <laughs> I'm not saying I wouldn't do that because right. I was so jealous. Because there's rumors about you being involved with the Pennywise incident. I am. I was. Oh, you were? <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't know that. So yes. what, can you reset the Pennywise incident first, I Adam, and let's see what Ricky- Okay. Well, there's round- there's the round number one I wasn't there for. Which one? Uh, throwing up. Okay, that I was there and yeah. part of that. You're part of that. Oh, yeah. All right, so uh, there's Fletcher from Pennywise. And Fletcher is a big dude, but not bigger than a big dude. In no, that. He, he looks like he'd be a big biker guy. Like He's, he's a massive big, human. Like, not just big, like he's big and he's scary looking. I played football for 10 years. I hung out with big dudes. Right. He's bigger than they are. Yeah. He's crazy <laughs> yeah. natural big. Yes. You know, his hand is six inches wide. Right. You know, like big. He's a mammoth piece of humanity. And uh, they did the show with you and Drew when I wasn't there. And he was like chugging booze and trying to throw up on Drew. Okay, here's the story. I wasn't allowed to bring guests on Loveline. So I told Ann, our producer, I go, let me bring these guys and my friends. They hadn't been on the radio yet. I go, they're in a band called Pennywise. Can I just bring them on with me? And she's like, sure, we're going to let you bring the band on this time. So they're getting really drunk. And Fletcher comes up to me. He's like, I'm going to throw up on Dr. Drew. I'm like, dude, don't throw up on Dr. Drew. He's like, no, I'm going to throw up on Dr. And he's drinking and he's eating pizza and he's drinking. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to know anything about it. I don't want to know anything about it. And sure enough, they're on the air, and all of a sudden Fletcher just and when he was puking, he was like, it was not going down. I mean, he it was, was like three hundred fifty. Like, yeah, it was. It was like yeah. horizontal, like right over Drew. And I just remember that show, and it's one of those things that you know, it's like of all the Love Line shows that I did, that's the one that people talk about. They don't remember those. Like that was a great interview. That was a great show. But they remember when things go horribly wrong, and that that was it. So, so he was cornering dr drew trying to throw up on him across Doc the soundboard <laughs> dr drew says he was pushing him off Ann was screaming in the the background I mean, there's tape of it somewhere oh yeah you, and you they were mad and Ann and everybody was mad at me you brought a guest on for the first time and yeah drew was drew was like visibly angry and like like i think drew like was gonna throw the guy around or whatever like it was it was but yeah it was but I guess bad at the moment then they weren't Allowed to come back, no. I guess, for a while. No. <laughs> but at some point, they came back. <laughs> Do you remember that? No. Oh, you that, remember? I, was that just that you? One. I don't yeah. think I was there for you that one. You weren't there for uh -uh. that one. So then Pennywise came back when I was the host. It had been, it'd been some years. And Fletcher had thrown up into a trophy <laughs> cup, a, a big trophy that had a cup on it, like a I don't mean like a, a goblet, but I mean like the kind of cup would be on a trophy. And he, he threw up into it, and then he put um, resin over it to like seal it. So it was like a, 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 a trophy of his throw up. I'm going to throw up. And then he brought that in, and then he started drinking and, and whatever. And then at the end of the night, he said, we're going to Poo Poo City. That's what he kept saying. <laughs> And he's a massive, massive human being, and he blocked the door to the to the studio. There's footage of this on YouTube, by the way. And he kept saying, "We're going to Poo Poo City," <laughs> and the cops showed up. The Culver City PD showed up, but they couldn't get him. And at some point, one of his record guys like tried to reason with him through the door, and he just threw him out and slammed the door. And he trapped me and Drew in the <laughs> studio, and he kept screaming, "We're going to Poo Poo City." <laughs> And the cops showed up, and he said he had a grenade on him when the oh. cops when the cops showed up. He told him to stay out because he had a grenade. And uh, I just remember being I was like, this is the second time. Poor Drew. He Poor was there. Drew. He was there for both right. Pennywise <laughs> stories. I just have the visual of this big guy saying "Poo Poo City" is just cracking me up, <laughs> but it does. He bl he blocked the door and said we're going to we're going to Poo Poo City. That's all. Now, <laughs> yeah. the the store I want to get to too was Loveline MTV, 
Right. Because I never really got the full story other than I got the story. It's like, Rackman's out. They're looking for somebody else. Uh, and I'll tell you what happened. But I, I want to hear your version of it. Ricky Rackman's here. Do you have to? Oh, we don't need to take a break. All right. That's fine. Let's keep going then. So um, my version of it is they were talking to me about doing Loveline on the radio. They were going to start syndicating the radio show, uh, but they weren't syndicating at the time. No, Loveline had been syndicated for a while with me. They said... No, it had been syndicated for quite a while. We got to look it up. Right when I started. It was, because we started recording at Westwood One. When you were... Westwood One, we were at. That's where we started. They said, when I started, we started in... um, Oh, what's San Diego 91X? Yes. They said, we're start 91X is your first affiliate. And that, as I recall, was the day I started. And then we spread out after that. But you were syndicated before that. The show had been on for like 12 years before me. Yeah. And I got on it and it became syndicated like right away. And oh. we were on quite a few stations. Huh. And then, well, now we got to look that up. Yes. All right. So um, I'm supposed to start on Loveline. But the radio, but I'm not yet. And then MTV is going to do Loveline syndicated show uh, or MTV Loveline. And you're supposed to host because why wouldn't you host? You host the radio show and it's you and Drew. So what happened? What happened was this is what I thought happened. I was on Loveline with Dr. Drew and then they came up with this idea to do the Loveline TV show. And I thought it didn't work. I said, I don't see how this show is going to work as a TV show. So I, I said, I don't really want to be a part of it. So then they decided, okay, well, we're going to put Drew with Adam. And then to get Adam and Drew start working together, and because Ricky isn't funny, <laughs> we're going to bring Adam in to work the three of you so Adam and Drew can start working together more. So then you'll be together for the TV show. Because I didn't want to do the TV show because I didn't think it worked as a TV show. But then with all the stuff that happened, I decided to leave Loveline and start my own talk radio show, The Triple R. Oh, that's right. Was that Kayla Sax? Yes. That had an interesting ending as well. Oh, I'm curious because I ended oh, up there. You don't remember the story why, how my radio career ended? Oh, I did. I do. I do. I do. Um, there's, um, uh, let, me, let me fill everyone in. Let's see if I can do this. Tim Conway Jr. Yes. And Doug Steckler. Yes. Uh, Tim Conway Jr. still on. I was on his show two weeks ago. Uh, Doug Steckler was a not a radio personality, but a very funny writer. Like, he was a humorist. And so it was Tim Conway Jr., who's son of Tim Conway, and Doug Steckler, who was, I guess he wrote f- for, like, SCTV and stuff like that. He was a comedian, writer. Uh, but very funny guy, and they did a show together that was that was entertaining, and that was in Kalis X when Kalis X was in Koreatown off of Wilshire. It never had carpet in the fucking floor, and they had you. I don't know, Mother Love, like who oh, else yeah, did I they? About that. They had all these crazy personalities. Uh, was that what did they have? Uh, Cindy. Brady, maybe? Cindy Brady was on the show. Uh, She's there's great. Ken Ober, I think. Yeah, yeah, they had yeah. all these names. At least with stunt the cast. regular guys. The regular guys who I liked, and they ended up moving to Atlanta. Tom Likas. Like Likas and, oh, God. I Howard just, Stern. Oh, Stern was in the morning. Stern was in the morning. And it was just a crazy, like, ragtag group of weird personalities. Cato Kalen. I replaced Cato. Oh, you replaced Cato yes. Kalen. They just went full... Stunt cast, the nasty man. I don't think that lasted very long. <laughs> no. Uh, oh, you found the poo poo city part of the interview? It's also when the cops arrive. All right, let's see if we can hear that part. Oh my God. <laughs> right. The listeners want me to vomit on you. No, they don't. <laughs> they do. They I swear. That. And, I, and I, I didn't come here prepared to I think do how that. Think how contrived that would be. Though, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How cliche would that, that you, be? Are you projecting I, it? You're telegraphing we, we already. We bought to Doctor Drew a trophy. Yeah, right. I vomited yeah. the trophy. You can tell I was filled it with resin. I mean, I did. That was I, cool. Right. Everything I could not to vomit <laughs> on, 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 on a guest. That might be We're going to have to work a different angle tonight. No, I they, agree. That's cliche. It's there's got to No, yeah. it has. It has. Right. But the alternative is fecal matter. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I, w- I swear <clears throat> to God. Why don't you teach him? Don't, maybe you can appease him by teaching him a new technique. They're putting music in. 
No, listen, Fletch, I can teach you I a new, will, a I new will. route. I can show you a new way that involves the anus. I really can. And the are jacuzzi. you sure? Yeah, I've you, done this. Okay, what, are you a squirter? Yeah. What you do is you get in the jacuzzi. And Forget you, about the jacuzzi. Yeah. We're, we're talking real time. Wait, wait. Let me okay, say. it'll let work with a garden it. hose, too. Well, it better work now because it's party time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm getting ready to go poo now. Is there a hose bib in here? <laughs> it's poo time. It's party time. <laughs> up, up, I mean, I don't care. Time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blockade the door and 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 just. I mean, I don't want to say what I'm gonna do. Hi, right, Fletch. I got a good idea. Speaking of the party, we'll do. Well, this, you we'll better do a figure. Trick. I call it the pinata. We <laughs> don't don't lie to we, me. We Adam. hang you from a rope and we smack you with a broom handle and see what comes out. All right. Well, look. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna hang myself from the doorknob. Oh my God! That's the place where you want to get out. That's that's the thing you have to turn to get out of the room. Mm -hmm. What you don't know is it it's about to be Pooh City for you, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not I'm not kidding around. This is party time. What Fletch doesn't know, Drew, is that when Forget I get about these, the spins, it's the, party time. It's Pooh City. I take please the, don't take him to Pooh City. I think <laughs> please don't go to Pooh City, Adam. <laughs> When's the last time Fletch was at Pooh City? <laughs> In uh, Panama City, Florida, about. A year and a half. Ago. Uh, what happened? <laughs> what happened? Uh, the last yeah. time we were on a stage. J Jason, well, yeah. uh, the drummer from 98 Mute, left right. a, a little, uh, baby it's Ruth. Justin. In Justin. Oh. They can't get it right. right. Let's just put it this way. If it Poo Poo City comes, <laughs> it's it's bad. <laughs> right. It's right. real, real bad. He he blocked the door. He's the biggest man. He's as big as the door jam, and he wouldn't let us. The studio's a third the size of this studio, so we, we were cramped. There, there is one thing that I just realized. Doctor Drew was vomited on, basically because of me, and you sure did not try to stop anyone. No. I mean, you were you were egging Fletcher on. It's like poor Drew. It's like hey, you throw up on Doctor Drew, and you're trying to egg Fletcher on to poop on Doctor <laughs> Drew. I I I decided that the vomit for me would be intolerable at that in that closed space, and that the poo poo city part would involve him having to take his pants down and stuff like that. And I could we could get around. Oh, him perhaps. you could get oh for me if someone went to poo poo city is worth in puke land. I would not poo poo city. I'm out. Poo poo well, city would make me vomit. I knew this was the direction the show would go. Hop showed up, never did anything to him as far as I know. It was a, it was a simpler time. So. Uh, you were getting back to MTV and we're getting back to um, Loveline. Yes. So you're not going to do. Oh, no, no. No, you're How talking you about fired the Triple, from R, the triple yeah. R. Ricky Rackman Radio. Right. Oh. After you, you leave so, Loveline, do you leave Loveline? Yes, I left Loveline to start my own radio show, the Triple R, which was, is just going to be a talk radio show. Did you leave because of the TV show and that you weren't included? No, in? I left because it was. It was Drew, Adam, and Ricky, and it just it didn't it didn't work the same. And Adam's obviously hilarious, and it, it worked great. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to see if I can be on a talk show where I can talk about whatever I want to talk about. I'm even doing a podcast version of that show too, called the Triple R Ricky Rackman Radio. But anyways, so I was not an I was not a healthy mental person there then i was dealing with a lot of the depression demons and stuff like this so one of the jocks said a whole bunch of bad stuff that was doug Steckler. yes yes he right. said it. he just and he kept on going on, Tim and on conway and on. they're saying it yeah did you use their studio when it was your show it was the same studio yeah everybody used the same studio except right. howard stern obviously and they just kept on going on and on and then i mean i have the record because i when i do my storytelling show on foot in the gutter i play videos of what they said on the radio and it was like how they were going to crush me how i should die how the why were be they better being without such me. they're they're I they're nice no guys i, I don't know no why idea. they got I seduced you with you i never said anything and they went on and on and on and on and on and then they insulted a girl that i was dating and they just kept on getting worse and worse and worse. So I went to the radio station, beat the crap out of the guy, and went to jail and lost everything. Went completely broke, and was totally broke for a couple of years. I mean, you're done with your shift, right? Yeah, but and I came back early the next day just to beat the crap out of the guy. They come and they come on after you. Like back in the day, you would get in your car and listen to people at your own station talking shit about you yes but you see i i didn't come from a radio background so i didn't know like oh the morning guy is gonna make fun of the afternoon guy this is what we do but i didn't know that and when they started making like 
Like I play, I've got like a long clip of exactly what they said and it was pretty ruthless. And I guess at that point there wasn't anything going on. So it was the top story on every single news channel and I, and nobody would hire me. And I went totally flat. So broke you to didn't zero. punch him out until the next day. Yeah. I went to the studio when they were on the radio and punched him out on the air. No, before they did their show. Before they did their show. And and why Steckler? Why not? Jim I did Conner? actually went after both of them. Oh, both of them. Yeah. Wow. But you caught up to Steckler. No, he was the first one. I hit. hit. I, I, when I say this, look, everybody knows I'm a little guy. You know. I mean, you know, I'm not a. But tough Steckler guy. like broke his jaw or something, yeah. right? Yeah, broke his nose. Or his nose. And then he went down. Then I picked up a megaphone. <laughs> I'm saying this. This is so embarrassing. And throw a megaphone at him. And then Doug came after. Then then Conway came after me. And I pulled back. And then they all held, broke it up. And then went to the police and threw me in jail. And I got. They called the cops. Oh, yeah. And, and, and they were like, you're not working anywhere anymore. And nobody would hire me. I mean, nobody. It was a popular show. I don't know how long it was on before the incident. Probably couple of years maybe two years couple maybe, years maybe yeah i would listen i would listen you know the you know the worst <laughs> remember you remember john and jeff yeah they were on it late night yes and they're klsx you too. know what it was it was them and i saw this guy carlos was on for a while oh but i remember yes carlos. when you did they did talk radio because they kept on saying the number because yeah. you'd say, our topic today is 1-800, and then today we're going to talk about this and this, and then we're going to talk 1-800, nobody was calling. Carlos was funny. Carlos would be like, hey, call us now if you've ever been cheated on by your old lady. And then the phone would ring, and he'd go, hello, Kayla Sex. And then they'd go, yeah, one time, Carlos, I came home, and my old lady was with my best friend. And he'd go, man, that's cold. And he'd go, 877-245. Anyone's been cheated on? And then that's how they call and you go, man, that's cold blooded. And he'd hang up again and just go. And I was like, this guy's not really exploring right, these issues. Right. And John and Jeff were the best of the worst. I I used to listen to them and just think, God, this is as bad as radio gets. They're on in the middle of the night and they go, we're two guys who like a drink oh and don't I want an umbrella that. in it. We're two guys, you hand us a light oh beer and we'll God. hand it back to you. We're two guys who feel like a woman should be wearing a skirt and guys are wearing pants. Like they were, they were doing like a I caricature totally remember that. of what two bros would do <laughs> like on the radio, but they were so clearly non bro -y. But they were doing this crazy so caricature of like, we're two guys. And it was the dumbest stuff. That was stuff. the commercial. Well, I remember, and this has scarred me for life. And I think, I'm, I hate to tell you how many times I think about you, Adam, when I'm in the shower. Because, <laughs> because I remember you saying 25, 30 years ago about having a squeegee in the shower. Mm. And, I, and you said like, this, I learned is, the, that this from is the most unmanly thing you could possibly eat. And every time in the morning when I wake up and I'm squeegeeing the shower. <laughs> right. No, I, I, still, I mean, I really remember that. I realized it was a gay thing. If right. there are squeegees in the shower. Right. And it's because Drew said, I bought my first condo. There was a squeegee in the shower. I said, gay couple? He goes, yep. And he goes, I bought my second house. There was a squeegee in the shower. I said, gay couple? He goes, yeah, I was a gay couple. I, I, so I realized squeegee in the shower was a, was a gay thing. I ran into someone today who said a word I haven't said in a million years, which is, I didn't say ridiculous. I said, that's recoculous. And then a guy at me said, is that a real word, recoculous? And I go, no, I just made it up. It sounds like ridiculous. I just It's a swear word you could say on the air. Uh -huh. Recoculous. I had all these weird little memories from back in the day. But I would listen to Triple R. I would listen to everyone on Kayla Sex. I, was, I, I loved the format. Which so was none. You, no format. But you punched uh, Steckler, like broke his nose. And, and then, and listen, I'm not trying to be a naysayer, but... Those guys are nice. Like they were both nice. I used to do their show all the time. Why were they no. talking so much shit about you? Because I, you know, because I started in the club business, I needed to promote my show any way I could. And I would go out there and make flyers and make stickers. One day I stole the radio van and broadcast it live driving down the street. And I would do stupid stuff. And they're like, who the guy is this punk? And they're like, Quentin Tarantino's calling on the show. And he says he wants to be on a guest. And he'd come down. And mm -hmm. just like all these crazy stuff would happen. And I was just like this punk from Hollywood. is like, this guy didn't even go to school to take broadcasting. And, uh, 
you know, then they said something about me and I said something about them. And it was obviously it was stupid on my part. It was dumb. It's, you know, but. So you get fired, you get thrown in jail. Yeah. Or how much, how you you get community service? Like, how does it work? Yeah. Yeah. You get, you go to jail. Did Doug sue you? They they were going to, and then they didn't. Oh, that's and, good. Uh, and also because that time, because it's interesting how quickly you can go from having money to broke. Mm. You know, and for me, it was pretty quick. Mm-hmm. So I had to sell everything. I mean, I had I, I was in an apartment with my power turned off, I had freezing, mm. and I had to get a job as a car salesman. Oh, really? You know, yeah, I had to get, which was tough because I'd be there in the dealership trying to sell cars, and people would go up to me and say. Uh, Hey, aren't you the guy from Headbangers Ball? And I'm like, yeah, can I show you this Jetta? All and right. you know who was the most ruthless? Which, which uh, I don't know if he died or not, but Tom Likas. Yeah. Tom Likas. Worst. Did he die? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Well, his career, always... either way, I could care less. And no one liked that. So he went, he went on the radio and he said, Can you believe Ricky Rackman selling cars? Oh, what a stupid guy. I'm like, Dude, you realize what I'm doing is having a job like everybody else in the world. So you're saying everybody that has a regular job. And he used to be this guy that used to talk about like, hey, this is how you treat your women. And when your women do. And then I'd see the dude at a Laker game wearing matching sweatsuits with his wife. And I'm like, oh, you're pathetic. I mean, he was just so (laughs) such a loser. I don't yeah, know if he's still alive, but not sixty-seven years young. Yeah, no one liked like us. It, uh, ev- no one liked anybody back then. Everyone was kind of a douche. I yeah. don't know. It was part of like rebel bad boy. Like you had to have a kind of be a bad boy to be on the radio. I mean, but you, I you, wasn't trying to be like I've never ever tried. Well, you like punched I, a coworker. Yeah, but th- well, this is what I always said. But you think if about any- Stern. Stern's coming in in all leather and like he's doing a morning radio and he's wearing leather pants and boots and stuff like that. Everyone was rock and roll bad boy. That that was kind of that's how everyone at Kayla Sex said they all adopted that. <laughs> everybody wanted to be unpredictable and everybody wanted to be shocking and everybody wanted right. to do this and they wanted to raise the bar. And they got to give that water cooler talk so people right, are talking right. about it at work and stuff like that. Yeah. The, the thing about both of you is both of you are exactly the same people on the air as you are off <laughs> the air. For better or for worse. Yeah, but I noticed this about Lycus when I first met him. He was not Tom Lycus. He's not that guy I on the air. I saw him at a Laker game. respect for him. I saw him at a game, and I said, yeah. dude, what about what you said on the air? And he said, uh, you know, Ricky, it's just for stuff on the air. And I go, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, My there was a lot of that. next neighbor if you want to go huh? to his house after this. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Isn't he in, like, wine country or yeah. something? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's a caricature. Um, I never really got it, like, you know, there's all the people that have pseudonyms and fake names and personalities and stuff. And I just thought this is going to be a long relationship if I have to put on an act. But it started with Mr. Burcham. I'm like, I'm not going to do Mr. Burcham. That's going to burn out like fast. Like I'll, I'll have to just be me. And if, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, we'll sell Jettas and McKenna VW. <laughs> and that was it. But it does like, like, like you're a funny guy. If we went and had coffee, you're a funny guy. And now you're doing what you do. And there's longevity in it because you don't have to say, okay, I got to put on my Adam Carolla podcast personality yeah. now. You know, I felt that, what it was. I felt that way. I felt, the. Uh, Like when I showed up, I was like, oh, Jimmy Kimmel, that guy's funny. And I should stay close to him. Whatever happened to that guy? I think he's he's selling cars. (laughs) But he may have worked his way up to fleet manager. (laughs) He does fleet stuff, vans, stuff like that. Right. (laughs) But I remember both of you guys. You guys were like you are. Yeah. yeah. And it's easier. It's easier when you're like you are on the air. Because you can go a little bit further. If they don't like you, then you're kind of screwed. But if they like you, then hopefully you can take it a little bit further. We have uh, cops arriving and uh, Fletcher talking about he has a grenade ready. Oh, jeez. Jesus Christ. That's kind of the way. Let's get some real questions in here now before Dr. Drew and Adam die. Oh, please. You can't that say that. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Of course it was. Are the, are the police listening? Hey, Chad, you and the headphones, you're through. 
When I get out of here, you're through. Now listen. You're listen. through, a fat boy. Fletch, please relax over here. Now the cops are here. You see what's going on? Oh my God! Oh, now, oh, police! Relax. All right, listen. Now, okay, I have a grenade. Just, I eight. have a live oh, grenade in here, <laughs> officer. No. You come near the store. I swear right. to God, I'm gonna explode it, Fletch. <laughs> that, that's funny. That was in the script. That's <laughs> in his belly. I think Fletch, the grenade. Fletch. Hey, Fletch, hold on a second. Fletch, listen to me. We're going to take another call. You're going to mellow out. <laughs> don't, 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 don't touch the button. Don't touch the button. Oh, what? I got please. calls. Adam, Adam, what? please, what? Uh, if you do, what? don't touch a button. I okay. swear to God. I swear to God. Don't Look, the guy's got his button. hand on the gun. Okay, I want everyone out there to listen. The police are here. <laughs> yeah. And I have something to say. This is live. Go ahead. I've been drinking for a few... Don't, Adam. Don't cuss, though, because I'll if you, drop if, you if you cuss. I'm not going to I'm <laughs> not right. gonna cuss. All right. I just want everyone to know out there in the, in the uh, control room, Jimmy Byron... <laughs> Randy is still in there. The police. Kill oh, you just cut. Cop now. killer. <laughs> Don't cut. Uh, There's like yeah, 10 the people in the right, control listen, room. We got to take a break. No, no. Yes. Adam, we do. Adam, we do. We, we got to You keep it on the air. Keep it on the air. We got to Keep it on the air. Show. Keep it on the air. Listen. Hold on. What the door won't. Do? Just put it back. Fletch, listen. Sit down. It's 1151, the clock says. You're causing trouble for your. That's trying to talk reason. Listen, forget about yourself for a second. What a I guess he's cussing or dumping it. Yeah. Yeah, it must be uh, dumping yeah. it. Dump button. Dump button. Let me just tell you Literally something watching button. that, okay? <laughs> First of all, I think I'm going to see Fletcher at this festival, and he's always been very, very nice to me. But there was a part when I'm watching it that it's not funny at all. That it's just like, dude, you're not supposed to say you have a grenade. You're not supposed to say people are going to die. And you probably don't say it when there's police around. Like, I'm cool. watching this and I'm like, holy crap. That's like, like, were you scared at all? No. No. You didn't sound very scared. No, nah, I've got low uh, pulse, resting pulse rate. I'm very, I'm detuned. When, as things get escalated, I, I, I tune down. <laughs> I'll actually get quieter wow. if things get more scary or hectic. If I if I'm in a race car and I lose control of the race car, I just let go of the steering wheel. I don't even try to overcorrect or anything. I just move my hand. What are you so driving I'm right now? What's your car? Or do you not talk about your cars on the air? I got race cars. Do you have what. a personal car drive car? I just your drive favorite? a regular car to get to point A to point B, and then hopefully get in a race car at some point and do a race car. You know, do a race or, right. or something like that. So whatever. Sometimes it's what people let me drive if they have a car, like they got a ride, and they'll let me do it because I'm not a, I don't have enough to do a professional Trans Am team or something like that. But they'll let me drive their Trans Am car at certain events, and then I have my old vintage, you know, Paul Newman race cars. Oh, which God, is I love your car, cool. and I love that I walk in here and everything's painted in that Gulf paint scheme, Gulf livery. which was always my favorite paint scheme, always. Yeah, by the way, it's this Saturday, right? Yep. Being the National Automotive Automobile Museum. Uh, Leno's going to be there. Ooh. Leno offered me a ride home in his plane. I was wondering. Oh, uh, yeah. How are you getting uh, back? Oh, yeah. That guy keeps it so tight. I He called me yesterday. He goes, yeah, catch a ride home? And I said, uh, well, what's the schedule over there for you, Jay? And he goes, well, we'll do the automotive thing and think... Uh, Four o'clock, five, six o'clock, and then uh, shows. He's doing a show. He goes, shows an eight. And I go, yeah. He goes, I do an hour and a half. I go, okay, nine thirty. He goes, we'll be in the air by ten. No way. I swear to God, I've done it with him at the Borgata in Atlantic City. He he walks off of the stage, walks into a car. The car goes, you know, three miles to the private airport or whatever. It gets out of the car, walks right onto the plane. There's no TSA. There's no metal detection. No nothing. He's on the plane 18 minutes after he walks off of the stage. That's what I'm telling you. And he's heading back to Van Nuys. Unbelievable. That's the way to do it. (laughs) Atlantic City flies from Burbank to Atlantic City on a Saturday, does the show, walks up back in Van Nuys at 4 a.m. Gave me a ride home in his Fiat. So, maybe. But I might hang out a little bit in uh, Reno because, you know, nothing wrong with uh, Reno and Lake right. Tahoe and everything. But um, Aaron Hagar is going to come by. Sammy Hagar's kid. Love greatest him. guy. The greatest guy in the world. You know Aaron Hagar? No, but I met Sammy several times and very nice person. Sammy's the best and and Aaron's son's like even better. Like yeah, it's, it's nice something in their... 
their yeah. bloodstream. All right, so back to a little more reminiscing. <laughs> so all I know about Loveline, the the TV show, right. is that Dr. Drew is a big Mr. Burcham fan, and he doesn't know anything. I don't know this at the time, but he doesn't know anything about comedians or me. He just loves Mr. Burcham. Right. And so they call him at Loveline or K-Rock, and they go, Rackman may be out. Who do you want to work with? And he just goes, I don't know anybody, but Mr. Burcham's funny. So that's the only comedian he'd ever heard was me, and he didn't even know my name. I <coughs> was in New York with the morning show for MTV Awards. Once, Remember they'd have the big MTV yes. Awards in yes. New York? You had to be there. It was a big deal. And it was a big deal that they sent the morning show for one week to New York City. I'm I'm a bumpkin from North Hollywood. We get to go. Me and Jimmy get to go to New York City. And and for me and Jimmy, it was like, we're going to go to Little Italy. We're going to get gelato. We're going to have so much fun. Like, this is insane. I, like, I, I was like a giddy teenager. I, I, you know, because I've lived in North Hollywood my whole life. We're going to New York City. And we're going to MTV Music Awards. And we're going to... We're going to go to the television radio museum and interview, you know, all these celebrities and stuff. And me and Jimmy are just like, oh, this is going to be so cool. And we get there and Jimmy and I are planning it all out. Like, here's what we're going to do, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, we're going to go to this place and we're going to go that. And Jimmy's got, I got my uncle Frank out there and he's going to make us cannolis, you know, like it's this whole New York Italian thing, and we're gonna be there for eight days. And I'm like, I'm out of my mind. Yeah. Staying in a hotel room, free food, you know, like like I'm 13. And and I get the call from my agent, and he's like, uh, I gotta get back to LA. Oh, and I go, what? Yes, we need you audition for Love Line. And I go, no, come on. I just got here. I just I mean Jim are going to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde tonight and drinking <laughs> beers, you know. And he's like, you got to come back. You got to audition for this thing. And I go, look, it's it's never going to work. I'm not good in these those like audition environments. Like I'm good, but th- I know what it's like. They're going to give me something and want me to memorize it. And I'm going to freeze up in front of. It. I'm not comfortable. I'm not being on camera. Like I, I could do the job, but the audition's going to suck, and they're going to pass, and they're going to go with somebody else, and I'm going to be back stuck in L.A. while everyone's <laughs> in New York for the music awards and eating Italian food, and I'll just be stuck back here. So I don't want to do it. And they go, they go, you have to do it. And I go, okay. And then I say to them, and I just ran into them a few weeks ago. I go, why don't you get Mark DiCarlo to do it? Mark hosts Studs. Studs is like really popular dating chick, you know, whatever. He's got tons of reps, tons of experience, nice looking, poised, you know what I mean? He's a TV personality. That's, but that's what it is. He's a TV personality. He's a proven commodity. So I go, get Mark DiCarlo to do it. I'm staying here with Jimmy, you know, and they go, get back here. You know, I saw that, boom, get on a fucking coach flight, you know, back to LA, get there. Next day, go on to Hollywood Center Studio soundstage, set up like a folding table and a phone that's not plugged in and tell Drew to sit here. And I'm sitting next to him and their segment producers are like going, I'm, I'm Tammy and I'm from Ohio and I got a problem with birth control. And I'm, we're doing a makeshift, trying to be funny. As Adam or as Mr. Bertrand? I'm Adam. Okay. Yeah. And, I'm, and when we finish, I'm like, eh, I think that went pretty good. And the reason it went pretty good is because it wasn't memorized the script. It was just like, you guys just sit together and kind of free flow it. And I knew, I listened to Love Line. I listened to Love Line when Poor Man hosted. I listened the whole time you hosted. I was a big Love Line fan. And I always had like, oh, if I get in that position, here's what I'm going to do, you know? And Drew liked me and it was good. And so we get up and I'm like, man, this went pretty good. Like, I mean, look, I got a real shot here. I go, okay, and they go, and with that's all. That's all we need. Great job. We got enough, but that's a nice job. And they start walking out of this pitch black sound stage on Hollywood Center Studios. No windows, just, just a pitch black. Those stages, as soon as you got off the set, it was pitch black, you know, because the, <laughs> the set would be lit and then bam, black. And so they go, 
Drew, Drew, just hang out one second. I want to want to talk to you about a few things or something. Hang hang behind. And he goes, oh yeah, okay. See you later. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I go out and try to like feel my way to get out and find the door. I um, go to push the door open to get off the soundstage. As I push it, the door just flies open. I don't even touch it. It just opens by itself. And a shaft of light like comes through, and it's so it's high noon. It's bright as shit out there. My pupils are like dilated. I can't believe it. But I see there's a figure standing in the door, and I'm like, oh, sorry. I can, and I literally bump into him, and it's Mark DiCarlo. You did this. It was perfect. It was perfect. Like I was like, and he's like, sorry, bro. And he like walks past me. I'm like, oh. He's going in to audition with Drew. Oh, my God. And I just go out in the party line. I just sit in my car, and I'm like, fuck. Fuck, I told him to get Mark DiCarlo. Now they got Mark DiCarlo, and, and Mark's done 200 episodes of right. studs. Like, that, that everyone knows who he is. He can handle this fucking job in his sleep. And I remember just going, why did you tell him to get Mark? I was kind of kidding when I said it, but I really wanted to stay in New York. But uh, he sat down, he auditioned, and then, uh, I don't know, two, two days later or something, they just went, eh, we're going with you. I'm like, sure, no Mark DiCarlo. He's like, no, that's it. So that's how it happened. I never, I was always like, oh, they said Ricky wanted more money. That's mm -hmm. all they ever said to me. Maybe they just Maybe said it to me because <laughs> they were scared I'd ask for more money. No, 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 I just, I just didn't think that it worked. Maybe I wanted more money too, but I don't <laughs> think so. I don't know. Well, they but you know what? Thank money. God everything happened the way it did. Yeah, you know, except for Doug Steckler. If it if that <laughs> didn't happen, I wouldn't have been as gracious. And I'm glad that I had to go out and get regular jobs again, so I could see like, wow, if you, when you get this back, it could be taken away at any moment. You know, is and then Doug I Steckler still alive, or did oh, he okay. succumb to his injuries? <laughs> it wasn't that bad. Well, no, but Doug Steckler was old when we were young. Yes. I mean, he was older yes. than than we were back back then. Like, it worked at, God, I think SCTV, TV writer. But you know what I did when I got fired? The way that I got back working is I created a NASCAR show where I would talk about NASCAR the way I talked about rock and roll. And I syndicated that and did that for 20 years. Yeah. So, and I wouldn't have ever done well, that if it I, wasn't. I think, I think what we're all learning from this interview is you are a fighter, uh, but a survivor. No. no, you're a survivor. Yes. Like you're Clark. Yes. Like you, like I, if someone said to me, what's Ricky Rackman's skill? I'd be like his motor. Like he's going out, reinventing himself, always doing something. No moving, agents, no producers, forward. no nothing. Yes. Just moving, like starting that club. Like I, when I was 22, I would have been like, I can't start a club. Who's going to let me start a club? The thing that I'm most proud of, and I think this is something that you know much better than I do, is everybody saying, why don't you write a book about having the highs and the lows and stuff? And I said, I want to do spoken word. I want to get up on stage and tell it. So I wrote this whole show with videos behind me, and I did one show, and it sold out. And then I got offered three more gigs. And then I did 40 shows, including four in Australia, where it's no opener, no nothing. I just go up on stage and talk for two and a half hours. And nothing ever in my career was more rewarding than me just going up you know, and telling these stories. And that was an idea that I just came up with, you know? And right now I'm currently thinking, okay, what's the next plan? What's the next plan? So, uh, yeah, it's just because I'm hungry and I, I want lots of stuff. And Well, let me plug your hunger. Doug Steckler, did you find out what happened um, to him? Can't he's, see if he's still alive. All but he's got a lot of writing credits and stuff, right? Yeah, it's, go through his IMDb. He must have written... Well, we can figure out when he's born, at least. Ricky Rackman's Cat House. I have the Cat House Hollywood podcast, and I have, um, which is just relaunched. There's only like one episode up in the Triple R. And do you know what I'm doing tomorrow? Mm -mm. <laughs> My wife isn't going to like that I'm mentioning this because no people don't know. I'm hosting the Pornhub Awards. Oh, really? That makes yeah, sense. Nobody knows that. I didn't tell you. Oh, everybody's clapping. Where's in that there. at? Congrats. It's the whiskey. The whiskey. Yeah, they have transformed it to it looks nothing. I mean, they dropped some money on it. But I figured I have done so many crazy things in my life. And I like to try 
unique, different things. You know, if the show, and first when they was like, hey, you know, because I, I mean, two years ago, I was doing interviews at Fashion Week, which made no sense. And because of that job, they said, would you be interested in hosting it? And I was like, okay, what am I going to do? What is the whole thing? And it just sounded so like, because I'm like Forrest Gump in a way. Like I just happen to be around where <laughs> you interesting yeah, things happen. I take this in the spirit in which it's intended. But I've worked with you and I've worked with Danny Bonaducci, And there's some similarities, which is you, I, he's got a lot of, he's a lot of personality. He would go out and do shows where like he told stories and stuff. I, he's, you can't really put him in a compartment. Like, it's hard to categorize him. He's a good dude, and he's got the motor. If I hadn't met him once, I would be insulted. Yes. But I met him, and thinking it was going to be like, oh, what a nightmare. Because I heard his radio show, and he was a good dude. And yeah. he is. He's a, he's the, I mean, you know, I've got Driven tattooed on my stomach. Like I And I want to, like, eventually one day, like, stop, because I'm old as dirt. But... You got to keep going. I mean, look, look, we're in this compound right now that Adam's got all this stuff. Your show, which you created this and built this whole little like empire. And you've got all these things going because you're driven. Nobody said, I imagine nobody said, okay, Adam, do this, do this, do this, do this. You've just created this stuff and you go, okay, now I want to do this. And, you know, it, I think what, what people don't realize is you have to work really, really hard to make it look like you're not really working that hard. You know what I mean? Like, well, all, Adam, all Adam does is he goes and turns on a microphone and talks. No, that's not how it works. Well, it's, But you work really hard it's, to make it look like you're not uh, working hard. But circling back, that's the key to the interview. The ones who are really good at it, seems really effortless, seems totally natural, and you have to do it for 10,000 hours before you can get to not try. Right. All right, Ricky, let me plug you uh, again. Twitter and Instagram at Ricky Rackman as well. Ricky, it was fun getting caught up. So fun. And yeah. this place is so cool. And thank you for having me on here. Sure. Uh, Lenny Clark, the, uh, who was great. Extended Family is the name of the show. And Mike O'Malley as well. Uh, oh, and I just want to thank Super Fan Giovanni for all the Love Line footage. Yes, as well. Thanks, Gio. Chicago, Illinois at the Den Theater. I'll be doing stand-up there April 19th and 20th. And then Salt Lake City. Wise Guys, May 3rd and 4th. I'm all over the place. Vegas and Bakersfield. Just go to amcroll.com. And until next time, it's Adam Carolla saying, mahalo. You can leave us a voicemail.